Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we will start in two minutes. So can you please take your seats? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we take our seats, please? And thank you all for coming again today on the second day of the uh, MAG meeting in our week of activities. And just a reminder again that um, we are online. It's, the session is going to be posted onto YouTube and a summary report will be out next week. If you want to take the floor, please raise your flag. And those at the back, can you please wave your flag until we see them? And then we'll write your name. And when you do speak, please say your name slowly, and whether you're a MAG member or not, and stakeholder group, and then you can make your intervention. Uh, please do. When you speak, um, make sure your microphone is on when you're speaking and off when you're not speaking because the way the cameras work is that they follow where the microphone, uh, which microphone is on. Um, so if you've got two microphones on, then it doesn't know where to focus and just focuses on the room. Um, for those people who are if you want to hear those people who are online, um, you have to use the earpiece. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and I'll hand it over to the chair to start the meeting. Good morning, everybody. That works now. Thank you. So just a little bit of a debrief from yesterday. I'm sure you all recognize this. Um, the four evaluation groups presented their suggested list of workshop proposals. The Secretariat was asked to provide statistics about gender, newcomers, stakeholders, etc. Those statistics were in line with the ratios of the overall workshop proposals received. The consolidated list of suggested workshop proposals and stati st <coughs> statistics has been shared with the MAG. The Secretariat took note of suggestions on how to improve the application process, session submissions, and the evaluation process as a whole, such as making the newcomer field or gender field um, mandatory. The Secretariat informed the MEG that the workshop acceptances will be sent out next week, indicating the importance of gender when organizing and holding workshops. And we had a rich discussion which is an understatement yesterday, about the planning of the main sessions. And we hope to find agreement this morning, which I hope that there's been some reflection over, over the evening. And so for goals for today, we would like to resolve what was left unresolved yesterday. Um, we scheduled an extra hour in the morning to discuss pending issues. And um, hopefully, we can be successful. So. I'd like to have a robust discussion today, but uh, one that is perhaps a little bit more efficient at getting to, uh, to done. Um, so at this point in time, I'd like to move us to updates on the parliamentary track and the high level track, youth leaders, et cetera. Um, and so I'll turn that over to the Chris. Chris. Sorry. Thank you, Paul. And thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone again. Um, I just wanted to, in, in terms of uh, agenda bashing a little, I'm assuming that we're 
roughly sticking to the same agenda that we that was shared already um, for, for day three. But one thing I was going to suggest, it might be nice if we formally set aside a little bit of that agenda to um, prepare for tomorrow's meeting with the leadership panel as well. Um, so I'm not sure where that would fall. It's probably something we can do after discussing the main sessions. But um, if we can sort of set it aside for ourselves so that there is that time and we don't, we don't run out the clock. Great. Noted. Okay. So who are our parliamentary track people? Parliamentary track, yes, I should buy her. Should we finish? Yesterday's thing, if there's any comments first. We can do that. Yeah, I think maybe we, since it's still fresh in our minds, we can just ask them to report back if, here, yeah. if um, people have any comments, um, any further reflections, because you did ask them to reflect over the night. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think um, um, what, what we can do now, now is, is um, uh, since the since chair asked, the chair asked for Mac to reflect overnight and sleep on the discussion that we had yesterday. Do we have any further reflections on the uh, main sessions? Any thoughts from, the, um, from where we left off with the six sessions? Okay, so I've got Carol and... Nima and Chris and sorry, Justin. Okay, in that order. Carol would like to go first. Good morning, everybody. Carol Roach, MAG member. Uh, I just wanted to recommend that we change the cybersecurity to cybersecurity and trust. Thank you. And uh, Emma? Um, good morning, everybody. Nima Lugangir, I'm a member. Um, I, would, I would like to uh, recommend that for the AI main session, shouldn't be left just AI blank, but we can make reference to when we're talking about AI, the biggest issues uh, that are cutting across everything is the ethics and regulation. So perhaps, you know, at some point we should zone in and, and, and clearly define the, if, if the main session is going to stay there, it's AI on what, rather than just being AI general. So if it's AI ethics and regulations or, you know, something like that, that is broad. And again, reference can be made to the different AI sessions as well as on the high level, et cetera. So that, that, that's, if, if it's that way, then definitely I'll be comfortable. And I believe the main session will then add value and get the intended results. Thank you. Oh, uh, thanks, Emma. I've got a suggestion. Since we have um, the other AI sessions, maybe we can take that deeper look into the actual um, agenda of that AI session in concert with the other three so um, not at this stage. We'll just put that as a placeholder, and then we'll see how we can make sure that the three aren't, you know, uh, just uh, they're not, first of all, not overlapping, and also that there is some connection that gives a wider picture. Um, but your point is well taken. Yes. Thank you. And mm -hmm. Justin. Um, thank you, and uh, Justin Fair, MAG member. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I think, you know, just based on some conversations after the meeting, I, I don't think we're as far off. I think there was just a good conversation yesterday 
uh, and and we are coalescing uh, around some ideas. Perhaps um, instead of just talking theoretically or vaguely, um, I think it would be helpful to maybe put some options up on like text that we can see. So perhaps the secretariat and, uh, with the chair can um, magnify in, not on the whole schedule, but just on the main sessions we're talking about. And then even if there are ideas under, say, I just heard on cybersecurity, um, you know, put the options up there and just kind of let us see it. And so we hone in on a few ideas instead of just talking, um, you know, generally about the proposals. Thank you. Okay, so I suggest if we can maybe put up a Word doc with just the um, the six and. I just can put in and then we can. Yeah, yeah. Would that be okay? I don't know who's <laughs> controlling this. Yeah, can we yeah, just put just copy that and put a Word document and then we can just have the six. So we just concentrate on those six. And while that's well, been that's done, um, we do have Bruno. Yes, Bruno. Yes, Bruno. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. No, just um, I've sent an email um, this yesterday, like this morning, <laughs> to the mag list about um, the compromise that we're making on streaming sessions on AI. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that I've repeated myself enough yesterday, but. It's just that I honestly don't think it's really um, fair with the other topics, but like topics, but not just that. I don't think that's um, cognizant of a very complicated and layered and um, dense global governance, internet governance agenda. Um, so my, I mean, one suggestion that I would like to maybe raise for everybody is for us to maybe do an extended um, main session on AI instead of the one hour and a half slot, we could do something that's slightly bigger, divided into two parts, one for the PNAI and another one that could be something similar to a main session on that topic, just so we had an extra one um, open for any of our other um, sub-themes, because um, in the end of the day, I really think we're forgetting or not being cognizant of some issues relevant to the Americas or I mean, Africa or the MENA region. And I'm a little bit afraid that in terms of efficiency um, and kind of like the organization of these sessions, um, we need to be really kind of like spot on on what the approach could be. So my suggestion is that maybe we put um, two of them together, the PNAI and the main session, and leave some space for another discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any reaction to that proposal? Yeah, Justin. Um, thank you. And yeah, I think just building on that, if there are other ideas, I think we now's the time. I mean, I I'm, I think we can be fairly flexible on what we do and how we or, orchestrate and you know combine or align and 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 all that. Um, but I think we just, if there's other topics that we think should be main sessions, uh, would encourage um, to propose those and, and put them on the board so we can see it. Maybe there are some synergies. Maybe there are a, a ways to align things. Um, but I, I think we just need to kind of see those options uh, right now so we can kind of speak to them and see where we can coalesce around. Um, yes, um, first of all, Bruno, yes, thank you very much for your email. I really appreciate that you took um, the time and to make the effort to just stress out the points that you raised also yesterday. And I can fully understand your concern with regard to the topics that should be covered by the IGF. 
And uh, I also appreciate the, um, the compromise that you are suggesting now. However, I think to merge or to change the formats, it's a little bit more complicated and will cause much more administrative issues than just saying uh, we stick to the, the current formats that we have, main session and policy network, etc. And um, the, the points that you also raised in the email, the, the topics that could be overlooked, uh, the current dominance of, uh, of uh, measures taken by governments in um, regulatory dis uh, discussions, significance of information integrity and impact of disinformation um, for the full exercise of rights and access to information, fundamental role of data governance and the development of data protection. I think this is, these are some aspects that we can really um, uh, embed or incorporate in the main session on AI because I think there is a direct link discussion also between fake news, for instance, uh, um, um, and, um, and, and the points that you were raising. So I think um, maybe we can also find, try to find a compromise with regard to the focus that we want to put on the main session on AI. Thank you very much. And Rita. <coughs> Thank you so much, Paul Amrita, for the record. Um, I think, as uh, Justin mentioned, we need to look into, rather than go into AI, non-AI, cybersecurity, non-cybersecurity, we look at what is it we want to, as in at least a broad level of what is the topic we want to discuss. Uh, it will help, as in we all want um, the main sessions to be relevant, main sessions that people want to come and look at it. So let's look at it from that lens and um, irrespective of AI being there, cybersecurity being there, gender or whatever, I think we need to look at what exactly we want in a broader scope. It will help us to discuss. Um, uh, keeping in mind that our overarching theme is the internet we want, empowering all people. So. That's my limited point. I think we need to get down to what exactly we want in terms of each of the sessions. Justin. Thank you, uh, Justin Fair Mag member. Um, yeah, now that we have it on the board, I, I think just kind of uh, um, kind of uh, responding to what I suggested in my own suggestion. Um, I think some of the things we suggested yesterday, so under gender, um, I think a topic that is uh, gender but is also aligned with kind of the overall theme would be something like promoting digital inclusion. I think it's a very important topic right now. So um, that could be something, and these are just ideas. Um, I welcome others to kind of um, do this, but perhaps this is helpful. So promoting digital inclusion. I think under cybersecurity, uh, there was a discussion yesterday about countering tech facilitated gender based violence or, you know, online harms, something. Uh, security and harms, those kind of ideas. Under AI, uh, yesterday there was uh, ideas about AI and human rights or a human rights-based human rights -based approach to AI. I think somebody also said a human-centric approach to AI. Um, I think there was others about AI and biases or biases, stuff like that. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to capture some of those proposals that were put out yesterday that I thought there was, um, you know, some support, maybe not, not full support, but some support for them in the room. Thank you. Chengita, can we have access to the document? We can put in our suggestions. It will be easier to process it. This particular document, if the MAG has access, we will put in our suggestions, so it will be faster. We can be faster that way, suggestion. Did you want to speak? Yeah, thank you. I just um, reinforce another point from yesterday. Um, we have been doing main sessions on access, divides, and gender, at least like for three IGFs now. So maybe my request here is for us to maybe think of a new approach. Um, 
to that can be something about divides and gender, but still, like there has been a really relevant um, research from the BPF gender a few years ago on what were the, the kind of like the issues in, for women in the LGBTQ plus um, community for act, having access to the internet. So my request would be for us to be a little more innovative in that sense. And um, in terms of the global governance one, I think what we discussed, or we, we have been discussing so far, um, has been kind of a broader, like, ego eyes kind of look on um, the, the global process in general. So something that would overlook CSTD, WSIS plus 20, ITU, the future of the IGF, and whether we should um, actually move on to digital governance issues um, more properly instead of just insisting on IG. And maybe for the sustainability, one good approach could be climate disinformation or anything in that sense. Um, could be a really relevant space for bringing in a lot of um, activists from traditional communities like the Amazon or anyone that's being highly affected by either the platforms allowing for some content to be monetized or um, some voices to not be heard. So, I mean, just some suggestions. Chris. <laughs> um, no, I just had Amrita surging here. Chris Buckridge, um, MAG member of the tech community. Um, I think on the sustainable and environmental um, uh, session, I think there's a lot that we can do there, particularly in, in sort of ensuring that we explore a bit the links between what an internet governance community, an internet governance um, venue, um, can do in relation to climate change issues and in environmental issues generally. So I think that's, that's sort of a useful, not, not a very concise framing, but something I'm happy to work, work more on to, to sort of bring that um, into um, some useful form. Awesome. Thank you again, uh, Justin Ferry, my member. Um, yeah, one the way I heard, I don't know if anybody from UN uh, EP is is here, but um, the way they describe the challenge that they they see it, I think, kind of colloquially within UNEP, is uh, digitally sustainable and sustainably digital, which captured both this idea of using digital and sustainability efforts, but also as we expand, uh, you know, the digital economy and digital transformation to do it in a sustainable way. Um, so if we're looking for maybe a catchy title, maybe sustainably digital and digitally sustainable, or vice versa, um, uh, could be an option there. Though, though noting it is a ripoff um, from UNEP. Um, Amrita, for the record, um, perhaps what we could look at, and this is just a suggestion, is um, enshrining um, a human rights and gender-based uh, cybersecurity framework or something in those lines so that we have the human rights and we also have uh, many times, um, you know, the cybersecurity aspects are looked at. I would say there is a gender angle also to it and a rights-based angle, even if you don't bring gender into it, but at least enshrining a rights-based um, framework into cybersecurity regulations is something which perhaps may be explored. Um, that's just an idea. Um, it could also be uh, for, uh, you know, Adam was mentioning could be that uh, looking at how to synergize the bit different regulatory frameworks on AI, which, is, which are being mapped at this point of time. Um, from a rights-based perspective could be something. And if we don't want AI, it could also be emerging technologies and AI. Yes. I 
think I didn't turn the mic off. Yeah, Chris Buckridge again. Um, I, I just sort of riffing a little on, on Amrita's point there about AI and how we could frame it. I mean, I think one of the interesting aspects that we dug into a little in a Eurodig session, um, and it's coming back to the, the environmental impact there, was this question of you know, AI being a very significant new technology and, and that we don't yet fully understand the environmental impact of. And I, OECD's done some good work in sort of starting to look into that, but I think the sort of real thrust of that work is we don't yet know. Um, so, I mean, I think there's, there's sort of an element there that we can dig into on AI, not just in terms of not knowing the environmental impact, but also just not understanding a lot of the different impacts that this technology might have and how do we sort of get to a point of better comprehension, better understanding there. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a, it's vaguer the more I speak about it, but I think there may be some sort of a framing for a session there. I'm sorry, just to quickly say that the link to the Google Doc has been sent to the MAG uh, private list. Somebody had a flag and then it went away. Bruno. No, just um, on AI or any regulatory discussions, I would just maybe like point as, as kind of a reminder for us to not over-focus on any European-centric um, approaches or like forums. Um, I know OECD is a really good space for like patterns and ethics discussion, but it's not entirely um, cognizant of the differences and um, like my main question, with my main like issue with the entire discussion on AI is that I don't necessarily think it's something we should take on an extremely positive approach to. There is a lot of biases and differences and things in society that AI helps enhance. And it would be a little bit um, strange for us to not discuss kind of the perils as we were talking yesterday, um, just in, and, and the issues that are facilitated by the existence of emerging technologies, algorithms, and things like that. So, um, I mean, I'm okay with some governance or even ethics or regulation um, discussions, but it will be really important to bring in on the biases and the issues and the problems and how much these technologies, they have been just um, making society worse in a lot of ways. Um, so that's it. Okay. Um, I mean, the thing with AI, I mean, we, because I have the feeling now at the moment that we are mixing uh, different themes. We can, of course, mix AI with environment, AI with gender. Um, but I think, um, I mean, when I ask myself, okay, what would be the, the, the value of having the IGF, a discussion on AI, I think we should look for something that is not being or hasn't been so much discussed now. I mean, the thing is, um, and it's not EU-centric view or perspective, but since the EU um, has just passed the EU AI Act, it's now very prominent, actually. So it's not because we, we have a, a, a very uh, specific perspective on the EU. Um, but I, I was wondering whether we could also think of AI in terms of what would AI bring in combination with other technologies. I mean, this is something very new, uh, be it AI uh, in combination with robotics, for instance. What does AI mean for Internet of Things? And maybe we can also use the main session to think differently, not discussing things that are already existent, or, but to, to do something different in terms of um, maybe, I don't know, maybe we could go into a main session and say, okay, what are the different scenarios that can we uh, imagine having AI coming in the future very much? So, and then that could also uh, incorporate the negative sides, the implications, but it could also show us the, the, uh, the chances or the, uh, the, the good things that um, AI could bring. So maybe we could m more focus on scenarios, presenting scenarios and uh, give more food for thoughts to the audience and uh, trigger also a good discussion on that. Thank you, Amrita. Thank you, Paul. Amrita, for the record. Uh, one thing we need to be careful about is the internet governance is meant for everyone, all countries, all economies, all and diversity. Um, regarding your concern, Bruna, about talking about the harms of ethics, 
the reason why I'm talking about regulations and how to balance it is because developing countries are trying to leapfrog into it. Um, when we talk about trying to balance regulations, it brings out the gaps also, that these are the gaps and these need to be addressed through regulation. I do understand EU is at one place, there are certain other things, but if you look at the majority of the world discussions, people are trying to use AI to leapfrog into many things, uh, which is inclusion, which is di uh, distribution, uh, equity amongst people, even healthcare, etc. So let's be cognizant. It's not you we want to follow, and no offenses mean governments are looking at it. But I think trying to balance between the aspirations of different re uh, regions, as well as trying to synergize these regulations to come to some places, something. Uh, which is needed because um, what regulation works in one place may not in total work in another place. Thank you. Uh, Nima. 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 Right. Um, thank you, Nima Lugangira, MAG member. I also just want to echo that um, the Internet Governance Forum is for everybody in the world. And right now the global majority are nowhere near where EU is and the US is. So we need to be mindful of that. A very good example is EU has, a very, has an excellent Data Protection Act uh, for the EU. But one of the biggest challenges is big tech companies behave in, have the best of behaviors when operating in the EU because EU has all of these uh, great legislations. But the same companies, when they operate in Africa, they operate total different behavior. So we cannot say that just because the EU has um, AI regulation, so it's great and everybody, uh, the rest of us need to follow or do a copy-paste approach from the EU. Um, so to me, I'm still insisting that, yes, AI cuts across everything, different sectors, but right now the biggest discussion, even amongst Africans, is how do you regulate AI? and how and what are the ethics of AI. So if, if we want to be inclusive in the discussion, we can think of AI regulation and AI ethics. That cuts across. The EU can give the best examples. Other North, um, global North countries can give their examples. And those coming from global South, the majority, can also share experiences. And that can be a more robust discussion rather than just being uh, one-sided, kind of one-size-fits-all. Um, so AI ethics and AI regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carol. Carol uh, Roach. Uh, I think Nima just stole my thoughts. <laughs> so, yeah, people are going to come to IGF to find answers. You know, we have to go back to our theme it's what we want, what the people want. And the countries have citizens that are running scared with regards to, to certain things. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I get these news reels or whatever it is. And I'm speaking to the person, I'm saying, you do realize that this is AI generated, don't you? What? Yes. So. Um, countries are realizing that I need to um, change direction here and look at this thing called AI. And as Nima says, it, it, in the global south, uh, we, we're looking for direction. EU may not fit what we want, but it's a start. So I think it, it's important. Thanks, Nima. Thank you. And I, can't, I can't read it. What is first? Odas? Uh, yeah, thank you. Odas here, uh, MAG member. I think that um, maybe you could be guided by the overarching theme, which is the internet we want empowering all people. Um, so what's the AI we want and how does it empower all people? I think um, what we've seen from AI is that it has often missed to empower all people um, by large language models not be able to um, work in majority world languages, but also how do we balance that with the opportunities that it brings uh, in terms of um, access to information and services in, in those languages. So I think maybe one area we might be 
uh, which was is echoing what everybody has been saying is that how do we balance the conversation between a building a conducive environment for innovation and research, but at the same time uh, regulating um, and avoiding um, and putting in place anti-bias measures. Yeah. Thank you. I can't read. That's uh, Bruna. Thank you. Um, on the approaches, um, again, I think Nema said it in a, and Nema and Amrita said it in a much better way than I would ever do. The U is not the only approach. Might be the one um, like doing the head start on the conversation, but it's. I mean, it's also kind of a very privileged um, ecosystem and a place to regulate AI from. The EU is where one of the main and the first um, regulatory frameworks on data protection comes from. It's also the pattern that most of our countries follow, but also the place in which all of the, like, the companies, they mostly do compliance in a much relevant way than they do in Brazil or in Kenya or any other parts of the world. So, yes, it can be one of the optics in, in, in that we use or one of the lenses to take a look at AI, but um, again, this is not EROTIG, it's IGF, um, it's a global conversation on a lot of these topics and um, it wouldn't be really fair. And when we, um, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is that like, my country is discussing um, an AI regulatory framework right now and the optics we're taking is immediately different to the EU one because we are trying to address and mitigate the risks of AI instead of just taking on a very positive approach on how it empowers people because let's be honest, honest it doesn't empower like 70% of the Brazilian population that are victims of facial, facial recognition or any other issues that are also facilitated by this technology. So. My, I mean, once again, I'm just reinforcing here, like we can be positive, but it's also a little bit naive for us to not touch upon the risks and the perils of these technologies, because again, it's a global conversation and not just a very happy and privileged, uh, more or less EU conversation on AI. Thank you. Justin and then Suki. Um, thank you, um, Justin, Fair, uh, Mag. Just two qu quick comments. One, just on the, the regulation, I think, uh, proposal, I mean, interesting. I just, there is the, the policy network, and so to the degree there is a differentiation and that we have, you know, not too very similar. I know they're a little bit different, but I just want to make sure that we remember there is the other discussion on the policy network, um, so we might not want to make it too close. It's just a, an idea. But the other one, I see that we have the Internet we want. Um, that that is the you know kind of overall theme. I wonder if just a catchy title could be the AI that we want, or the AI we want, or something like that, which seems to capture a lot of the um, the essence of these different kind of conversations that um, we want to kind of drive a future where AI is more inclusive and mitigates the harms while promoting the good and have a shared vision. Um, that is a lot to capture in a in a short title, <laughs> but maybe we can come up with something creative like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to say and um, make clear that, um, I, I mean, of course, the EU AI Act is not, is not the, I don't know how it, it's been now perceived. And uh, um, I also think that the points that you raised, Bruna, could have been really good statements uh, at the IGF itself, and uh, but uh, apart from that, I just want to uh, make a suggestion also with regard to the discussions that we have. I mean, uh, within GIZ, when we, as as a managing board, we have discussions and we can't really fully agree. There is one principle that we follow, and that says disagree but commit. And I hope that we will reach a point where we have an, a commitment to whatever we agree on here. Although, in some points, maybe, some might disagree. I mean, and I think this is really, really important for us, because otherwise we, we won't leave the cycle now of discussing and evolving uh, and going deeper into AI discussions and so on. And I think this principle we should really um, maybe use, disagree but commit at one certain point, as, as a MAC group. 
Thank you. Chris. Thanks, Paul. Um, Chris Buckridge, Tech Community uh, MAG member. I, I mean, I think uh, Suki's point is, is fair. I, I mean, I think I also take the points that Nima and Bruna and others uh, have made. But I, I also don't think that this is a discussion exactly that we will we'll resolve here. I think we have MAG members like Nima, like Bruno, like Amrita, and many others who will ensure that this is not just an EU-based sort of discussion of AI and that the, the different situations, the different contexts and challenges uh, or, and even approaches, as Bruno says, uh, around the world are represented and understood here. I mean, I think the risk, and maybe this is the risk they're, they're sort of perceiving is that because so much work has been done in the EU space, the easy option is to, you know, you'll have a flood of speakers or potential speakers who are willing to talk about that. Um, as a MAG, as a Secretariat, as, as this community, we need to make sure that that's not the easy option that we take, that we ensure that those other voices um, are included and, and that we make space for them and that we craft the discussion to include that. But I certainly have confidence in this, this MAG to do that. I think we have the right people here to ensure that we're not sort of um, focused only on the, the global north. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm not, not to undermine the, the concerns, but I, I perhaps don't share such strong concerns because I, I think we're well-placed to address that. Thank you. Um, you and Jess. Thank you for giving me the floor. Dino Delaccio, MAG member, uh, IGO, UNGSPF. Um, I just want to, given that I do not have access, I'm not part of the private list, just wanted to give a comment and a suggestion. I read the 2022 report of the IGF, and uh, I actually noted that there is a, a very well uh, captured section on what uh, was the message from last year about AI that somehow cuts across many of the topics that have been raised. For example, I read in the report that there were three messages in governance, in trust, security, and privacy, and rights and content moderation, which I think are very relevant if someone goes into the detail. So my, my comment would be, is there a space there to also ensure that there is continuity between IGF session, that what was said last year is actually uh, rolled over and advanced and considered in the following year? So that, like what we spoke during the first day, really the outcome of this uh, work is demonstrated with a, some sort of a continuity where we can demonstrate that there is progress, not just in raising issue, but also monitoring their implementation within the larger community. Maybe it's implicit, so I apologize if I say something that's already given for granted, but maybe it's a perspective that uh, it's worth considering. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nima. Thank you, Nimal Gangira, MAG member. Um, I just wanted to make one thing clear. I think we're, the discussion that we're having now, it's a very important discussion. And you can see that we've made progress since yesterday's discussion to today's discussion. So to say that uh, we need to reach a point to end this discussion and not go round and round, I think that's not right. We should go round and round as much as possible to make sure that we reach a place where we'll have a good discussion, because I, I didn't quite understand um, my colleague's comment or what, what she was trying to get at, but I think it's, it's, it's very important to, to, to make the environment be such we are able to freely um, voice our opinions, irrespective of being judged, because nobody here has a bad intention, but the intention is to make sure that we have a robust discussion where everybody from all parts of the corners of the world, especially the global majority, are going to be able to take something from the discussion but also get their voices heard. So I'm personally very pleased with the progress um, from yesterday to today. We're getting somewhere, and I think it's a very important discussion to have. Thank you. Thank you, and Suki. I mean, what I find interesting is that I mean, just to recap what happened, I mean, we had a discussion yesterday that started AI as a main session, yes or no. We continued this discussion and, until Amrita proposed, okay, let's 
not decide now, but let's look into the six proposed uh, uh, themes and uh, think of what kind of perspectives or uh, focus we should, we should have. Now we have a discussion on AI. I see a lot of bullet points, but we haven't even decided that AI will be a main session. So I think that's why I'm a little bit confused because we are spending a lot of time and I know that the discussions are really valid, but actually we haven't even discussed whether AI will be a main session and now we are looking into the, the bullet points, which is a little bit absurd to me actually. So that's why I propose that either we decide AI is a main session and we continue the dis discussion on the content or we continue the, to, to capture also the other three points, I think, which are being left, right? And not, and, and finish the discussion on AI now, because I think as long as we haven't uh, decided on AI in a, as a main session, I think it's, it's just, it's not efficient and not effective to, to uh, continue this. Uh, thank you, Nima Lugangir. I think what in the morning when we all got here, um, I think Justin, myself, Amrita, I'm not sure who else, we did, we did say that AI as a main session, but not AI alone. It needs to be clear, AI what? And that is when Justin suggested perhaps we should have clarity on each of those main sessions proposed. What's, what are the main topics under it to give clarity? So this is what we're doing right now. Because AI as a blank, that one is not acceptable. That is why we're going through these points right now to get better clarity and consensus on AI what? Because it cannot be AI general. So I, I, I thought that was, that was, a, that, was uh, the, 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 that was the discussion and a lot of people contributed towards that. Thank you, Bruna. Thank you, Paul. Um, just to build up on that, I also think that the reason why we're focusing on AI is because there is also a PN AI session that's slotted on the agenda. So based on a lot of the requests that were done last year, like on past the two sessions on fragmentation. What we want to avoid here is duplication of the discussions, and that's why yesterday I thought that it would be a good idea to have maybe the two together, because we don't want to occupy an entire morning with the same discussion on AI. Um, that's not really well defined. So um, that's why I think this, this exercise is, is rather valuable. So maybe two questions um, for the PNAI folks. How is this that we're discussing different um, to the PNAI approach that's been, um, what's being done so far? I know you guys have been exploring avenues for like mapping the problems and the issues about AI and also how it helps elevate voices. So one really honest question about how this is different and be, um, would people be open to discussing content moderation in AI? Um, just because I think we are also still leaving behind some other aspects of the sub themes and maybe using um, some sort of a connection between AI, content moderation, and freedom of expression could be a good take here, given that um, this information is also a really relevant topic um, in any agenda this year, and also the UN is discussing information integrity. So, yeah, two questions. And Bruna, Amrita, for the records, as I mentioned, the PNEI is looking at the interoperability issue, the gender and race issue, and the sustainability issue. So what uh, obviously this should be discussing is not anything in those, and that's why I mentioned it yesterday, not because of what they're doing, but so that people have clarity. But as uh, Suki mentioned, it would also be good to know what the high-level session is so that we do not kind of overlap, but since we don't know this, that is why this is NBSAT, but I think she brought in a critical question. Why are we deep diving into AI if we don't want to have AI? Thank you, Justin. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think the reason, and I understand, you know, the, the kind of deep diving, we're going in the weeds when we haven't agreed to the concept, but I think that was the challenge is that, that there was concerns about agreeing to broad, uh, topics without some discussion about what those would look like. So my personal opinion is, do we need something on gender? Yes. Do we need something on AI? Yes. Would I be comfortable agreeing right now to just having a gender main session? I'm not sure, right? It's, it's just, it's too open-ended. It seems weird yeah. that the IGF has something that vague at this point in time. And the same, frankly, with AI. So I think that we need to scope out what exactly angle 
or new topic or lens we're looking at these issues this year to see if it makes sense to have a main session on it. These are all important issues and there's other important issues. The question is for the IGF right now, what are the main topics we wanna really focus on? Um, so that's I think why we were going through the exercise just to see what the, the options could be. And then just um, before we get lost, another thing, for the sustainability and environment, I did propose the um, digitally sustainable and sustainably digital. Um, so if we could reflect that up there. And then I think for the GDC, I, um, I think we all agree on a GDC session. I might just add though, like a uh, GDC colon, um, a multi-stakeholder perspective uh, or something like that. So it's a little bit clearer what we expect the conversation to be around the GDC. It's not a briefing out. This is a, a multi-stakeholder view of the GDC process um, that we expect to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn and Adam. Hi, good Carol. morning, everybody. not me, apologies. Oh, sorry. Is it Adam or Carol? We look alike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, again, I, I agree with, with Justin. Um, we do need, and so we need to look at all the other topics. Um, we have gender sitting there by itself. Um, gender is affected by cybersecurity, by AI, by governance, everything else. So I think we do need to just take a break from the AI and look at the other topics. Adam. Um, having been suggested that we take a break from AI, I will now talk about AI, not, not town halls. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think Suki made a, a good question to us. Have we agreed there should be a session on AI? I will, I will make the case for we must have a session on AI. I think if we look at the, the words coming out of the Secretary General's office, if we look at what are the issues in technology policy today globally, the, the issue we see is artificial intelligence in some form or another. So I think this forum has to address AI and it should try to address it in a way that is relevant to what the IGF uh, and our structures can do. Uh, Dino mentioned going back to the messages from last year and we should try and learn on what we've done before. Um, there was a very good session on AI and looking at the messages, what it's essentially saying is that global agreement on AI norms cannot be achieved in one straightforward process. While there are some existing norms, these are mostly soft laws rather than binding principles. As noted, there has been some change in that because of the European Commission, but I, I don't think we need to focus on that, although it was discussed in the main session last year. Um, back to the messages. The development of meaningful global standards will require effective participation from all countries, including developing and developed countries, and inputs from regional initiatives, as well as the engagement of all stakeholders. That paragraph, I think, directly addresses what the IGF is, which is the development of global standards, which we can comment upon, effective participation, which is what we're about, from all countries, which we're all about, including developing, and would note that we had um, speakers from developing countries who were quite brilliant during the main session last year, and inputs from regional initiatives, which of course we have because we have NRIs. Um, I think the role for us here is to establish the IGF as part of an essential part of this ongoing global debate. We are the only multi-stakeholder process within the UN system. If the UN Secretary General and the Tech Envoy are very, very keen on this topic, which they are, then what is our role? I think we should establish a very clear function for the IGF. And one of the recommendations that came out of the main session last year was some mechanism within the IGF where we would be reviewing or checking progress um, of all these global activities, soft law, et cetera, et cetera, um, giving a role to the IGF within this, this global discussion. And that is one where we bring in 
meaningful, effective participation from all countries, points of view, stakeholders, etc. So I would look to a main session where in 90 minutes, because we only have 90 minutes, where we can actually suggest something achievable for the IGF to do. Um, and that's what I'm saying. We need to think, how are we going to establish the IGF within all these global discussions that are happening multilaterally very often? How can we establish our the group that we're involved with and, and care passionately about. How are we going to make sure that the IGF has a role in these processes? And I would look at some mechanism for the review, ongoing implementation, effective global implementation of AI discussions. Uh, and I think that would be something that we could have an outcome for, and it would be an outcome that establishes the IGF firmly within these discussions that are happening across the UN system and others. So that's, uh, that's my pitch for an AI session, and I think it could be quite hopefully uh, useful, not only as an informative session, but as one that gives the um, IGF an ongoing purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carol, and then Ed Morrell. Carol, my member. It seems that Adam and Carol are the same. Um, I would like to take what Adam has said and extend it to all the topics instead of looking at um, what we want each topic to say maybe we should say what what is the outcome that we're looking for for each one of those topics whether it's gender cybersecurity what do you want to come out of it so once you decide that it'll be easier for the organizers to say, okay, this is what we're aiming at. These are the type of people that we would want on the panel so that we could come up with these outcomes because IGF is about outcomes. So I think, as Adam said, we need to start focusing on um, what's the outcome. Okay, hey, Alison. Abdul Abdurrahman, MAG member. Um, sorry to back to AI again. Uh, just I was thinking about how we approach AI, it will determine what we need to add to it. So if you look from risk minimization point of view, if you want to, to minimize the risk of, of AI, then probably a topic on, on, on cybersecurity, on, on um, way that we minimize the risk on the globe of, of, of AI might add it to the AI. If we look from the other side, which is the opportunity of AI that will impact on the world, then probably we need to add something similar to inclusion or maybe even the impact on SDGs and, and, and activity on, on, on that side. When, when I look to the workshops list, I think from risk point of view, there is a good coverage on the workshops. So there is a lot of discussions about, about how we uh, yeah, protect the world about, about from, from, cyber, from uh, AI uh, misuse. But from opportunity point of view, I would highly recommend that we go, if we want to add something to AI, it should be from opportunity point of view, probably an inclusion or, or something related to the uh, impact on SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. Rambo? Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, uh, Honorable al Haji, um, a MAC member. Um, I think for me, um, you know, the, a the AI we want actually um, you know, sets the stage. But because I think most of us actually have agreed that we need to have AI. And, uh, and, and from all the discussion we have, I think most of us actually are agreeing that we need to have. But what exactly do we want? Now, the AI we want, actually, we can have discussions around HR, um, discussions about human rights, discussions about intellectual property. And if you can organize a forum where you can have one person talk about one of the oldest issues. And uh, for regulation, personally, I think it may be premature now um, because we really need to understand what it is before you actually regulate. So, so I think we can just touch a little bit on it and then get the orders, for example, talking about the environment, intellectual property, you know, HR, human rights, issues, and gender issues, perspective, and then we leave it for people now to decide. But for me, for now, I think it's just a matter of actually telling people exactly what is available right now. Um, but uh, in terms of regulation, you, I think maybe it may be pretty much so. Because again, um, something that's actually just evolving, and then you want to start to put a lot of regulatory frameworks it may stifle innovation. That's my perspective. So I think what, is, what we can do now is we go with AI, the AI that we want, where we, people can discuss various areas 
and then we can make conclusions based on those things. Because again, AI is so wide that I think um, having only one particular area like human rights only may not be worthwhile, but we can have AI we want, and then people can talk about different areas, and then we, we take it from there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Alisa Heaver for the record. Um, so we've been discussing uh, all these different topics for quite some time now. Um, and in the document, the Google Doc, um, um, there have been a lot of suggestions um, for all these topics, but we've mostly been talking about AI um, and a little bit about sustainability and environment. I, I would like to run through all of them briefly and then at the end take a decision on which five we will choose because otherwise we'll keep on running around in circles and circles and not deciding upon which five out of six we will in the end choose um, and then we can like delve into them more more thoroughly um, either as a as a whole group or start splitting up in, in smaller groups um, because we are kind of getting time limited, I guess, as well. Thanks. Thank you. Go for it. Okay, I'm not sure if it's over. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, just um, driving back to the topics. I think if we take a look at... Um, the policy brief and, and a few of the policy briefs that have, have been issued by the UN recently. Um, I would say that we have like maybe main um, themes. Um, connectivity is one of them. Upholding human rights is another one of them. An inclusive, open, secure and shared internet, um, but also digital trust and security, data protection, empowerment and AI. I think we are in agreement more or less to having AI, some discussion on security and trust, um, some debates on sustainability and digital governance. I'm a little bit concerned that we are overlooking at this point um, a lot of discussions on upholding human rights um, and, and given again that this was um, one of the topics, not just from the deep dives, but the GDC and um, that we aimed at least at the beginning of the year to have some sort of a connection between the IGF and, and further and future process, I would maybe urge for us to, to not forget about that because I, I, I'm actually one of the, the, the few that might think that the whole argument of making it cross-cutting, it kind of like drives into a, a secondary place instead of a really relevant one. And um, following up on, on Alisa's um, suggestion, maybe we can just take a good look at each of them, maybe do a little breakout group, like 10 minutes to see whether we all agree or just we can all go through the list and see whether we all agree with what's being um, suggested here in general and see what is missing, what is lacking in this list because there is a lot of discussions lacking. And last but not least, um, I mentioned this on the email this morning. Um, this year, the IGF more than ever needs to sustain and consolidate its relevance. Um, and to some extent, we can um, achieve that by diversifying the spectrum of not just speakers, but the topics that are being discussed. So um, it's really good for us to, to, once again, take a look at that, make sure that everything is locked in and um, if we're not forgetting anything um, beyond the ones we have been discussing repeatedly. So that's it. Hey, Chris. Thank you. Chris Buckridge, Tech Community Mag member, record. Um, a lot of thoughts here. Uh, I, so I think sort of a plus one to uh, the comments Adam was making before, and I think Bruno sort of alluded to this as well in terms of the importance of approaching this strategically from the IGF's perspective. Like, a secondary but still very important goal for us and aim for us in this, as well as pulling together a, a sort of a useful and, and productive discussion, is to position the IGF strongly, to really consolidate um, the, the importance of the IGF 
uh, particularly in relation to a lot of the discussions going on in relation to digital cooperation. Um, I, I, I agree. I think, you know, AI is, is whether we like it or not, and however, whatever our perspectives on the issues, it is the issue or du jour at the moment. It, it, it is being discussed everywhere. And the IGF, if we don't take up the challenge of making a relevant and useful contribution on that topic, we're simply hammering a nail into the coffin of the IGF. We're simply make, positioning the IGF as irrelevant to the actual discussions that policymakers and society want to have. So I think we need to bear that in mind. Now, I, I mean, moving away from AI, and I think we do need to sort of, in, in relation to all of these topics, um, begin to drill down a little t to how we, we frame them. I think the idea of five main sessions is, is not something we need to be set in stone. I think there's a lot of discussions about, you know, how AI is going to fit into the opening ceremony and what, what a DC session would look like. So I, I think there is flexibility there and we need to be aware of that. At the same time, I don't think we can do everything. I think we need to make sure that we're not trying to cover every issue with this IGF. And I think that's something that the IGF needs to lean into in terms of the 2022 IGF will not be the same as the 2023 IGF, which will not look the same as the 2024 IGF. We have five days. We have a limited number of main sessions. We need to use those effectively. And we probably need to, you know, some things will need to get prioritized one year, which then get deprioritized the next year so that we can do enough of a deep dive to be useful um, and, and provide input to those discussions. Um, there is a lot of good work uh, going into the document here that if you scroll down, you don't need to right now, but um, there's a lot of good bullet points being put under those, those sessions that are starting to um, give us some idea of what they would look like, and I think that's, that's really useful. I think we have not yet got one. Um, we've got human rights listed there, but we probably want to, if, if there's going to be a main session on human rights, that's going to need a lot more context than just human rights. So I think if, if we can add that and start to develop what that might look like, that's going to be um, very important to consider going forward. The other thing, and again, sort of harking back to the original point about the positioning in the IGF strategically, we met, this was mentioned in relation to the sustainability environment session here. There was a, a policy network. It did have an outcome by drawing on that, by sort of referencing that and doing some follow-up, looking at what happened there, we help to validate and legitimize the fact that the IGF has produced outcomes. So we need to be thinking that way about all of these sessions. What outcomes has the IGF or its intersessional activities produced? How can that be referenced in a productive way in these sessions and contribute to moving the discussion forward while simultaneously driving home the point that the IGF does have outcomes, the IGF does have an impact and have relevance to these discussions. Um, so, I, yeah, I'm not sure what the best next steps to, to see, keep working on this are, but good work already going on there, and um, we do need to move towards locking this down. Good. Thank you for giving me the floor again as a non-MAC member. I just wanted to, to underline what was said before, that uh, if human rights do not feature in a main session, we should consider what message is behind that. I think it's <coughs> the same <coughs> things that uh, Chris has already said about AI. It counts also for human rights. We have a role to play. Internet governance has a role to play in assuring uh, human rights and realizing human rights. And if we don't put that with high priority on the agenda, that is a, a message to the community, and we might lose the community of human rights advocates in internet governance, and that would be a failure of the Internet Governance Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Adam. Hi, thank you very much. I um, just wanted to say, I think I said it yesterday, I, I don't think we should be bound by five opportunities for these main sessions. It's 
good that the Secretariat has laid out the opportunities here, but this is not the final construct, so don't lim I don't see any reason why we should limit to find five topics in this way. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to me that we did that, we do that. Um, secondly, I think, just think about what the IGF does and, and what skills we have, what we're bringing to this. And yeah, I'm particularly keen, as I said, on having an AI main session. I think we have to address that, otherwise we're not being relevant. I'd also be very interested to hear from the host country, noting the, the, the sessions that they've proposed in the high-level tracks, um, the leader sessions on, uh, you know, data, free flow, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a very relevant issue for us globally, and it would be good to have uh, leadership from the host country in that with multi-stakeholders and the MAG, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it reinforces the fact that we're in Japan, we're in Kyoto, uh, and it's a global issue that, that Japan, our hosts, are pushing. Um, and I think we have many stakeholders from around the world who would be able to contribute to that discussion. Um, so I, I'd like to see something around that data flows, management of data, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I will stop there. Thank you. Oh, hey. Oh. Okay, then Bruna. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I really can't see from here. No, just on the human rights and freedoms. I think um, there has been a lot at our table, like at our plates recently about um, freedoms, rise of authoritarian approaches to the internet, restrictions of access, um, internet shutdowns. And looking at the list of workshops we approved, um, there is a few of them on um, safeguarding free, free flow of information amidst conflict or um, the role of encryption to safeguarding human rights or even um, how to balance advocacy with big tech in restrictive regimes and um, also addressing corporate accountability in the majority world. I think that there is a lot of space for maybe us to discuss um, one possible main session on human rights. I'm not saying it needs to come in like over gender or any other of these sessions. I do agree we need to have human rights as a cross-cutting issue, but if we were to look at one specific session on human rights, it would be interesting to kind of discuss uh, more or less the state of the art about um, restrictions and freedoms and how this affects the state of the internet and, and the way it is um, nowadays. Obviously, it's something that we would need to coordinate with um, discussions such as the PNIF one and, and other spaces, but there is a lot to say about it. Um, and just to give another example, I do think the Ukraine uh, matter on um, the sanctions and, and things related like that is yet another example to add to the basket. So uh, maybe a suggestion would be for us to discuss freedoms, restrictions, and how to uphold the internet as um, a collective, open, and accessible space for um, empowerment of citizens. Thank you. So I just want to check after all of this discussion, as was pointed out earlier, the First thing was, are we going to have an AI session or not? I think it's uh, the sense of the room is 100% that we're going to have an AI thing. I'm pretty convinced that after... 98%, yes. After... 98%, yes. 98%, yes. <laughs> um, I, I am pretty convinced that... Um, there's plenty of material to have an endlessly interested and interesting session. I don't want to have that session here. We want to have it in Kyoto. Um, and so I would like to propose that we defer the subtopics under AI to a work party but that we make clear that we have adopted, for the sake of the timing slots, we have adopted AI as a topic in 
in this part of the program. Does that work for anybody, Bruna? So Sarpo, I, I, I just don't know whether we should commit on a working group for, for AI if we haven't discussed how many slots. Are we going to have in the end of the day? I mean, there is some consensus and we all understood AI is going to be in the agenda, but can we please commit on the number of slots first? Just for us to maybe have a clear perspective on what are we touching, like we're discussing. So, Chris, and I don't know your name. Maurice. Actually, why don't you go, if you have something you'd like to say. You, you can speak now. I am a journalist. There are not many here. Uh, if I were to find, to look for an issue, an internet governance issue in relation with artificial intelligence, which makes sense to me as a journalist, I would say how to find something intelligent in the mass, in the artificial mass of knowledge, which is produced, for instance, by Springer Communication, Springer Publication, just to take an example of a typical bulky content provider in hard knowledge. And from my sentence and the start that, uh, phase that I see, you can see the light years which exist between a journalist and all of you. Uh, very few journalists attend the IGF. I did in the early years, but I felt so alien and marginalized that I stop, I return this year. I have been attending all the WISIS sessions from the inception. There was a man, one of the managers of the WISIS process, Mr. I think uh, uh, Abdul Wahid Khan, uh, Vice uh, Assistant, Director, uh, uh, Assistant uh, Director of UNESCO. Upon retirement, he said, for me, the great mystery is why no Jews ever Come, no journalist ever comes to with this. And it's the same riddle here. So I am not going to make a speech on that, but you can witness the misunderstanding which was built over years. But I am quite ready, since I am young, still young, to come back for several years to try to bridge the misunderstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, thanks, Chris Buckridge, MAG member. I, I mean, I take Bruno's point about wanting to lock down what sessions we have, but I'm still a little vague because we were discussing yesterday, there's some discussion of the opening ceremony or part of it being dedicated to an AI discussion. So I think at this point, I'm not even sure what the possibilities are. Like, are we talking about something in the main session plus an AI session, plus a PNAI session, is uh, something in the opening session, something in the, a main session, and PNA. Now, I mean, at that point, we're not far off an AI day. I'm not, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think there are, there is scope to sort of build a conversation across a number of sessions in that way that would not be repetitive and would f focus on different issues. But that would take work. That would take very conscientious effort to make sure we're not simply having the same discussion three times. Um, so we need to keep that in mind if that's the approach. But at this point, I'm a little fuzzy on what the options are. Justin. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Yeah, I, I just, I, I worry that we, you know, we, we are in some ways overcomplicating uh, the challenge. I mean, it's going to, it's impossible to kind of see all 200 events and know everything about them. I think in some ways we have to kind of pick the, the low hanging fruit and, and start to fill out the agenda and then um, see what kind of the remaining issues we are. I mean, I, I think there's already, I, I think everyone here has agreed that the GDC 
will be one of the main sessions. So maybe we, we move that up. I welcome others to opine if that's incorrect. But there's one we, we could take. Okay, here's one on this. We've, we've kind of, you know, more or less agreed on that. Um, I also think that we should just pick AI. All right, as a, sorry, let me just take, uh, can you just move um, GDC up on top? And, and then I do think that, that, that AI, agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, AI, I mean, to me, and I've said it before, I, I, I understand that there's other sessions here, but at the opening ceremony, that's more controlled by the organizers, the, the, the PNI, PNAI uh, is more controlled. I think that there is a moment where you want to have a multi-stakeholder conversation that is more inclusive and uh, somewhat more open-ended and less structured on AI at this moment. And so, and it would be very strange to me if the IEGF this year did not do that. So um, I think that there is a lot we can work out going forward I, and ways to incorporate other elements into this. But, I, you know, I would encourage folks just to agree that this needs to be a topic that we discuss at the IEGF this year, though we need to work out some more. And then I think we can just start continuing on. What are the other ones that maybe no one ha- that everyone agrees to? I don't know if it's a sustainability environment, other, and then see where we are because I just this this notion that we we need to know everything before we can decide anything uh, is is becoming a little bit like hard to kind of uh, conceptualize. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I've similar thoughts, really. It's um, AI, Global Digital Compact, which is quite a specific take on, on, on that process. I think I'd almost have a subset main session on the future of governance as a broad topic, looking at WISIS plus 20, where, where we go beyond that, given that the IGF is, you know, an, a child of the WISIS process. It would be quite interesting to at least acknowledge that. Um, Digital governance, data and trust, I think is important. I think it is important that it's not only an important topic, it's an important topic for our hosts. Um, Sustainability and environment. I think there's a lot there. I don't know how we wrap in gender and human rights as issues, whether they're standalone or not, and would be, you know, just listen to my colleagues who are much more expert on those issues than I am, but I would also retain those. Um, Just work with these and just see where we go over the coming month. You know, we have a mag list to discuss. It's, it's open and others can jump in and comment as well. But I don't think we need to just work with this list and see what would we start to flesh out as a session. Make it a challenge. What would you flesh out under these six or seven bullet points and, and see where we go? We're kind of going around in circles in this room at the moment, I think. Thank you. Thank you. I agree with what Justin had mentioned, that we kind of, whatever we've agreed upon, we kind of move it up. Um, the discussion on the future of IGF in terms of this is et cetera is important. Perhaps uh, changing the headline from, di- to, from digital governance m- may help because for, you know, for people in this room, digital governance may mean something, but when you go... Uh, uh, out in public and talk about digital governments, uh, even governments look at it as a digital public infrastructure or uh, an enabling e-governance, etc. So it might be the wordsmithing can be done because that's something which people look at it in different ways or digitizing things, etc. So if we are looking at the future of uh, internet governance, the VCS plus 20 or other things, perhaps we may want to frame it in a better way and um, Personally, even uh, sustainability is something which was raised and it is important. And if no one has any issues, it could go up the ladder. But again, it's just my suggestion. If anyone has objections, they could raise that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, let's ask that question because um, is everybody in support of the sustainability and environment main session? If so, we can just make it green then.
Uh, is there anything else on the list? Um, I think what um, was being mentioned was the future of the Internet governance, the BISIS Plus 20, which comes in the digital governance, you know, that perhaps we can better wordsmith it later, but I think that was something which is important even for the sustenance of Internet governance. Chris Buckridge. Um, I, I, mean, I think cybersecurity and trust is in there. I think there's a yes-no question as to, on that as to whether that's one and the same with the BPF main session. And I don't have a strong preference there, but I think it... I, well, I would have some concerns of a B, BPF cybersecurity main session and a cybersecurity main session, but it's been done before, and if it's done intelligently, then that's that's okay. But I think, yeah, certainly there is a session on cybersecurity that is can be made green. Th thank you. Yeah, I just, I, I mean, going back to the conversation yesterday, I, I might not have a perfectly formed idea, but I do think that there is a very relevant conversation that incorporates security, trust, gender, human rights, digital inclusion. Those topics are all coming together in a very important way that um, there are a lot of gr uh, groups and people who are marginalized online in the use of technologies. And, and, and you know, even if we connect the world, if people are being forced offline because it's unsafe uh, for them or their families or whatever, that is a huge problem. And that's what's happening right now in, in many places, in every country, basically. Um, and I think that it's a moment where we can have that conversation which does, I don't want to say check a lot of boxes because that's not our goal here, but to incorporate a lot of different elements into a very timely conversation around online risks or online harms or, you know, uh, gender-based violence online, those kind of topics. Again, what's the, how do you shorten that to like four or five words? I don't know. Uh, we can come up with something. But I think there's the essence of that is there and something that we could talk about here. Thank you. I think that whenever we put more than one topic at the same basket, the same thing that happened last year is going to happen again. We had a session on accessibility and human rights. The human rights aspect was overlooked um, for the accessibility um, access to the internet discussion, which can be um, a guided decision. But we're not taking this guided decision, and I don't think we're at that moment yet. My point is that um, when you discuss GBV, gender-based violence, or like, um, I mean, any other perspectives that are brought into um, fostering um, more violence or discrimination against groups is something completely different from the cybersecurity um, chat or can be completely different from the cybersecurity chat. So I, I'm personally against us putting cybersecurity, trust, gender, and human rights all in the same basket because we need at least one of these as a standalone um, issue as we're doing for sustainability, as we're doing for AI, and um, so I, I would just maybe ask for us to be a little more careful with these discussions and not put everything in the same basket because we know it is some, some aspects of these discussions are going to be overlooked. And cyber is a relevant topic, but so is upholding human rights, so is um, discussing an oversight, um, like some sort of structure to AI at this moment. So, I mean... As long as I'm keen to defend my issues here, I do think we owe it to a global community instead of just the topics we're working on. So let's please discuss um, gender, human rights, and cybersecurity, not all together, but try to separate at least one of them from the basket. Thank you, Amrita. Um, so, um, we want a trusted internet where people can come in, 
um, it can be any issues. It can be not getting access to the internet. It can be uh, uh, gender-based violence or whatever it is. Perhaps the discussion could be on how do we build trust on the internet to make it inclusive, uh, equitable for people, uh, just not limiting to one thing because, uh, and trust also comes from many aspects, uh, how platforms are free to be used or uh, even regimes, etc. So there could be diverse people coming and speaking on the concerns and how that can be addressed. Um, if we don't want to get into, uh, you know, something specific because, um, you know, uh, because it's just not gender-based violence which uh, affects women or others from not coming online. And I know there are too many things we can't bring in all parameters, but if you want to broaden in it, say that, okay, people lack trust online. I'm, I don't feel secure when I'm conversing with her that someone may be snooping. Surveillance is also something which is there. So perhaps bringing the trust factor and letting the diverse speakers bring in their perspectives and how those are being addressed. Adam. Thank you, thanks Paul. Um, uh, I suppose on human rights and gender, it's not an issue that I'm, I'm expert on, but it's incredibly important. So I hope those of colleagues who are expert on it will propose some sessions. We, we want it, so don't think we're trying to exclude it, but we need you because you know what you're talking about to propose things because it's, it's, it's not something I can do. I'm just saying that, you know, my personal view as a MAG member is I support that you, what you're saying about the importance of it, but please guide us in, in making it happen. Um, data governance, trust, data flows, I think is a very important issue. It's something that we hear a lot about across the policy world. So I hope there will be something on that. Um, I would not try to say cybersecurity and trust necessarily. I think we can leave it as cybersecurity. Trust is there um, and always will be. Um, I wouldn't want to close down the opportunity that perhaps it would be a session about, top of my head, something like capacity building. What, what is required? What is the role of multi-stakeholders in capacity development and building? When we think about processes that are happening around the world, what is the role of multi-stakeholders in that? Perhaps it's capacity building, so perhaps we would be highlighting something like that. Again, trying to think about what are the unique selling points of the, of the IGF? It's that we're global, it's that we're multi-stakeholder, um, and we have certain expertise and skills. So what are we going to bring to our sessions that are that reflect those sort of selling points. Um, the other thing that we hear a lot about at the moment is that digital technologies are bad. Um, we see that, unfortunately, from the Secretary General's office. There was a press conference two or three weeks ago where he was unfortunately very, very negative about di digital technologies. And I think we all recognize there are very significant harms. Um, however, there are obviously very significant opportunities because I think we all remember uh, living under lockdowns, under restrictions, uh, having IGFs online. Um, we would not be here today if it were not for digital technologies. And by here today, I don't just mean in this room, we probably wouldn't be living in the houses that we live in. We probably wouldn't be sending our children to the schools because the schools would be shut because without digital technologies, we'd probably be living in caves. So, quote me on that, but think about life without digital technologies over the last three or four years. We would not be here. So framing digital technologies in the negative, I think is, personally, I think that's not correct. So let's think about the positivities of this. What are the opportunities of access? What are the opportunities of inclusion? So can we have a session that is somewhat forward-looking and positive? I would like to see because we shouldn't forget the importance of people who are not yet connected or don't have those advantages, but frame it in the positive about why we want people to gain the benefits we have. So I would try and frame something in the positive um, around the opportunities of digital technologies, and perhaps that contrasts us, our view as the IGF, with some of the prevailing views from, from other uh, forums. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. So oh, thank you. Um, we have allocated and used up 
all of the extra time that we programmed into this morning, which doesn't mean we can't continue to talk about this, but there's other things that we need to do too. And so I would like to I'll give everybody an opportunity to have one more one more statement made um, and stipulate to all the, the ones that we already have said over and over and over again. Um, I take it from the discussion again that there's no there's no disagreement that there will be an AI function. It seems clear. So our challenge is programming what that means. And we can't program that in this room, I think at this point. But what we can do is create a working group to, to work on this particular setup. Well, to take the inputs, to work on them, to refine them, to report back to the mag, and with something that can be concretely um, delivered. And I'd ask for your support in doing that so that we can actually deliver a great program. But so everybody gets the opportunity to have one last statement made. Uh, it would be good if we can have a volunteer facilitator. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so much. <laughs> um, we'll go. We'll go down just from we'll do the you this way for your comments. So that's and if you don't want to comment, that's fine. We'll start with uh, you and Dino. You get the opportunity. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. So uh, I. I support the, the, the theme that uh, being identified, and uh, as I alluded to before, uh, I would strongly suggest to reflect what was said in the previous IGF forum, capture and reflect the messages, and demonstrate how the IGF 2023 intend to bring those topics forward. Uh, I agree with the distinction that have been made. I think that uh, the terms that have been identified so far are very broad, and therefore it is uh, advisable to break them down in the specific perspective that the IGF 2023 wants to address, because every bucket is composed of many facets. And I think over time, the what is in front of us, what is on the agenda of today, it, it changes, although still within the high level topic that can be a cybersecurity, can be digital inclusion. And therefore, I think it, defining what's going to be the focus of the IGF 2023, I think allows the participant to prepare themselves and to contribute in a, min, in a meaningful manner. So I support the um, the call for specificity rather than generalism. And again, definitely try to keep track of what was said last year and what is going to be done this year and what's going to be proposed for the following session. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't think I have anything additional to add at this point, I think moving forward with some working parties to define these a little better is, is the best step now, so thanks. Anyone else? Yeah. Carol, you want Carol, to Carol, uh, MAG member. Um, as my twin Adam was saying, I think we need to um, look at digital technologies and what people think of it. It's really not the technology that is bad, it's the people that make use of it and how they use it. So I would like to suggest um, maybe we change cybersecurity and trust to digital technologies and trust or digital technology security and trust. Justin? 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, just on, um, uh, first off, just when we say future of digital governance, I kind of strongly recommend deleting WSIS plus 20. Uh, after that, I, I, I think we understand the concept here of talking about a lot of the different processes that will lay the groundwork and provide the ecosystem for digital governance. I would not classify WSIS plus 20 as digital governance. They're not synonyms, so I think it's misleading. So I would suggest deleting that. Um, to to Amrita's point, I, I, or I think Bruno or Amrita, or it was Bruno, um, I, I agree. When you try to like get too creative and put a lot of different elements into a topic, one tends to kind of rise and the other gets dropped, and that's a, that's a challenge. I think Adam's point about the uh, need to, to not just focus on negative, which is always a tendency, but focus on positive. All of that said, uh, I think that there is a conversation that is happening uh, and it deserves to be part of a main session, which is about the use of this technology. Is it uh, a safe, secure place for all people uh, and that we're doing whatever we can to ensure that it is a safer, more secure, more trustworthy place for all people? And that includes, it, it's not limited to just a gender issue. It's not just an LGBTQI uh, plus issue. It's not just a children's online protection issue. It is, it is for everyone uh, in every country. And this is the conversation I think that was had at UNESCO. I think it's happening in other places. It's happening at national levels. And there's a conversation I think for the IGF. So my suggestion, I think going to, to what Amrita said, is not, or I don't want to put words in her mouth, it's not to kind of have a gender, human rights, security, trust, like all that. I think just say what we want to talk about, and it, and it sounds like something like safety, trust, and security, or um, safety, security, and trust online, or something like that, uh, would I think be kind of capture that topic that is happening uh, in a lot of different places and, and should probably be a main session. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, about the approaches um, in general, whenever we add um, the safety and security aspects to anything related to digital rights, we tend to go towards the direction of law enforcement and perhaps criminalization of users and something that is less cognizant of the whole discussion about human rights or human rights in the digital age or anything like that, first of all. Um, so once again, maybe um, it's better for us to have human rights as a standalone or human rights in something else, but um, in a slightly separated perspective than this one. Um, I don't think we need digital um, technologies and trust. Um, I think we were supposedly addressing that already in the AI and emerging technologies. It's a conversation that we opted for putting together as a sub team. And last but not least, I, I mean, I, I take your point, Adam, about us not approaching technology from a negative aspect, but I also come from a country in which a parliamentarian was killed um, because of violence that escalated from the digital realm into her life. Um, and she was also a victim of like um, online um, based campaigns, hate speech, a lot of racist um, like language, and this is continuing to happen. Um, we cannot ignore this. And that's why I'm, I keep on pressing the like, the point about bias and the issues we have about these technologies, because it might be really the case that in a lot of situations they do act on behalf of our empowerment, but we are no longer at that stage of saying, well, we cannot regulate internet anymore or platforms because it's gonna halt or like um, stop us from evolving. We do need to acknowledge the risks and the perils. And I do think that a lot of regulations recently have been trying to address it from a human rights perspective. So, I mean, I'm okay with this, not just taking the, the, the negative approach, but it needs to be conveyed in our agendas as well, because it's, it, we cannot ignore this. Um, not every part in the world comes from the same perspective. If you don't know how to read, you're not able to be empowered um, from the internet or even have access, or you're gonna continue to be a victim of a lot of um, gender-based violence. So. Basically, my points, and last but not least, on the human rights session, I think there was a suggestion on freedoms, um, restrictions, and how to 
um, like a human, how to ensure a human rights based internet for all. Um, so maybe we can build from that and, and like throw the gender discussion on that and, and some of, also some like discussions on race and, and um, a lot of discriminatory um, languages. So yeah, another suggestion. Justin. Yeah, sorry, sorry to come back in. Just wanted to make sure it reflected on the board the uh, the proposal for online trust or uh, safety and trust online instead of cybersecurity and trust. I think they are fairly different kind of suggestions. Um, so um, on what is it five? Yep. Um, maybe make sure that's reflected. So when we carry forward the conversation, it's not lost. So on five, there's cybersecurity and trust. I would also put like, <clears throat> you know, uh, or something like that, and uh, trust and safety online um, to capture that concept. Anyone? Yeah, me. May I request the other MAG members in the room or online to also give their suggestions? It should not be the only speaking. Does anyone want the floor still? Including online people. Okay, so we'll, on moving forward, we'll set up a working group. Suki's going to volunteer to be the coordinator. And um, thank you for your service. Uh, just a short question. Would working groups be open to non-MAG members or only for MAG members? I mean, it's up to the mag. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's really up to the mag. Yeah, yeah. that was the sometimes yes, but previously it was also sometimes no. So. Mm -hmm. Given the sense of the topic, I think that that is not the problem. Okay, how are we on time? So. Um, Updates on the hunt, never lead us track. That'll be very quick. Okay. Alrighty. Next item on the agenda. Okay. I'm sorry, it was, it, I promised the card was up before you closed it. Um, I'd, um, I think I said yesterday, I'd prefer if we could continue to discuss in a mag plenary rather than breaking into subgroups. I think what we've heard in the room is that people are, not absolutely sure that we have finite topics here. We're talking about, you know, issues moving between these different different sort of buckets. Um, and I think it would be better to firm up in our own minds before splitting off into groups of five, six, seven, eight. Um, and if we do that on the mag list or a brand new main session list for everybody, then anybody can jump in. Although I would while we, I think observers are important, I think it should be a mag process. This is what we're hired to do with our great salaries. Um, so, you know, I'd like to keep it, as the discussion seems to be still undecided on what is a bucket, let's keep it in the general discussion until we, we firm up what we're talking about. Otherwise, we'll end up with all kinds of mushy mess, I think. So if we could keep it in plenary, as it were, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Chris, you're going to say the same thing. Uh, not, not exactly, though. He's <laughs> somewhat supporting it. I, I mean, I, I'm looking ahead to our agenda because I think you're right. We have other things here, but I'm a little unclear. And maybe it, it would be useful to get from the secretary what this roundtable exchange with facilitators of the intersessional activities is this afternoon, and whether that's something that we can perhaps, if, if we're not resolved on this, and um, it could be moved to a separate virtual session. Um, certainly not to, to uh, 
to deprioritize the the important work going on in intersessional activities but i do think getting the main sessions locked in is is really the primary goal has to be the primary goal of these two days so it, yeah at, at just in terms of thinking about the agenda that would be my input thank you i think regardless um we need to take a pause from this topic and hopefully that will allow us to clear a couple of the remaining items on the agenda and uh, actually get some of the rest of the work done. Um, and I have no doubt that there'll be plenty of people at the time to come back to what we've just been discussing. But I think if we take a break, we'll all be more refreshed for that conversation. So for, so for right now, we'll stop. And we'll go to the next item on the agenda. And then um, that'll probably take us to lunchtime, maybe. And then we'll see what happens after lunch. <laughs> Hopefully everybody's okay with that. I get the sense that we're, otherwise we're gonna continue to go around in circles. No, and we're all in substantive agreement and so much of it just we we need to think that the break to freshen the way we articulate and uh, good opportunity to just take a little sit back so the next items on the agenda is for Chen Chengatai to provide updates on the high level. So, oh, so. yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chair. This will be very quick, um, so we can catch up a little bit um, with the time. But as I um, had said previously, and it's basically what's on the um, plenary hall draft schedule is that we are going to be having um, these uh, high level tracks. So the first one is understanding data free flow with trust and the titles may be massaged a bit as we um, go on, but uh, that is the first one. Um, uh, data free flow with trust. And then the second one is um, evolving trends in mis and disinformation. The th third one is looking ahead at um, WISIS plus 20, um, accelerating the multi stakeholder process, because I think if we have a high level discussion on um, the WISIS plus 20, which is what we're moving into now and we, with its particular importance to um, the IGF uh, is a good idea and is um, highly topical. And then the next one is um, access and innovation for revitalizing the SDGs. There's the SDG summit this um, year. I'm not too sure exactly um, which date it is. I think it's actually before the IGF. So. Um, I think that will also be um, topical. And um, so those are um, the high level leaders um, tracks that we have. And I did uh, mention this uh, special session that we're gonna be having with uh, Maria Ressa and the uh, former New Zealand Prime Minister. Um, comments on the time have been noted and will uh, take a look at that um, but I've had comments on both sides that it's good to have a real deep dive and we've had comments that say uh, one and a half hours maybe a bit long but um, we will take a look at it and we'll also take a look at the actual plan of it to see whether or not we can fulfill that can be filled if that can be filled and we'll also uh, be talking with their teams on that as well so um, those are the sessions, um, just very quickly. Yes, so um, the next one is for um, parliamentary track.
And Celine, please take it. Mm. Ah, uh, sorry, Justin. Um, thanks. I, I was just curious on the, the SDG session, when we say access and innovation, access and innovation to what? Are we, are we talking access to the internet, digital technologies, innovation in the development? I, I, I mean, there's a lot of discussions about the SDGs, which are really important. I just, maybe some clarity on what exactly that session uh, is getting at, because it just, to me, those are just kind of, they're important words. I just yes. don't know what to call it. No, but in context. relation to the SDG, it's in relation to the SDGs. So it's not generally, um, it's um, access and innovation in support of or in uh, revitalizing the SDGs. So we will have a concept document that we will um, pass around. But then and also another important point as well is that when we have the speakers confirmed, we will also ask the speakers and construct and change the session based on the speakers that we have so it is relevant and the speakers of that session will be speaking from their experiences or from their um, expertise so that will make it actually a, a better session but we will be passing around uh, that concept note. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so after the discussion that we had yesterday and today, I don't know if I should be excited to share the parliamentary track or rather scared, but to give you a short overview, um, the parliamentary track, we started doing it in 2019 and we extended also the activities, not only at the global IGF, but also the regional ones. Last year, we had a very successful uh, regional parliamentary track in um, uh, Malawi. And this is the reason why we start doing it also at the Asia Pacific IGF that is to be scheduled on the 31st August and 1st September. Um, and we will then continue with the parliamentary track at the African IGF. Um, That's going to be. Oh, sorry. Please. Let me just. Um, small point. Mm -hmm. um, it's in collaboration with or back to back with the Asia Pacific and the African IGF. Yes, so, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes. The dates that you see here aren't the dates of the Asia Pacific or African IGF. Uh, those are the dates of the parliamentary track at um, those regional IGFs. And um, the African one is going to be held from the 18th to the 20th of September in Abuja, Nigeria, while um, the parliamentary track sessions at the annual IGF will be on 9th and 10th of October. So. Apologies, uh, on 8th and 9th of, uh, of October, my mistake. And um, a virtual session to set the scene will already take place on the 15th of uh, September. So what are those uh, parliamentary track sessions uh, going to include? There are going to be roundtables, um, as well as open but also closed sessions to have members of parliament um, also be able to talk uh, in, a, in a safe space, let's say. And then uh, what we're also going to do this year, uh, sessions uh, together with youth uh, or just an enhanced engagement, let's say, with the uh, youth. So, for example, members of parliaments being invited at the youth uh, uh, sessions and vice versa. Um, now coming to the topic. So we've um, asked, we, we did a call on the IGF website to ask members of parliaments about their priorities or their field of interest. And we've also shaped the um, uh, concept note together with the host country and also with the IPU and the title of the main uh, parliamentary track at the annual IGF is going to be shaping digital trust for the internet we want. And um, so trust is the main theme and there are going to be three uh, distinct sessions on data governance, artificial intelligence, and mis- and disinformation. And we do know that those are very big themes, so we decided to have those themes at the global IGF, and then also at the regional IGFs to include the regional perspectives, preparing, let's say, for the, for the main uh, parliamentary track. So now this concept note still has, is with the IPU, still has to be um, uh, officially accepted by them as they are the co-organizer of the global annual IGF uh, parliamentary track. And we're um, then going to send invitation letters through the IPU to all the presidents of the parliaments. 
and we're going to identify the speakers. So that would be it from, uh, from my side for the parliamentary track, and do not hesitate to ask questions if you have any. Thank you. A quick question on whether the list of parliamentarians is open for um, further contributions. I've been asking this over and over again. We do have a good pool of parliamentarians in Brazil nowadays that are working on digital governance issues, um, not just on the civil, but many others on the fake news draft bill, AI governance, and other things. Um, but they haven't been quite um, reached in the past years, but I, I'm, I'm help just putting myself out to help reaching out to these people and mapping them as well, because it's necessary, yeah. Thank you very much, Bruna. And, and this is also, so the invitation letters for the main uh, IGF are being sent um, by the IPU to have a better reach, but this is also one of the reasons why we're um, also extending our parliamentary track in the regional, um, uh, in the regions of the world to also have a better reach locally. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Celine, for that. And um, I think I'm going to echo what um, Amrita said on the chat and also what Bruna said. Um, it's, um, I think we usually go through the IPU each year, but uh, there is not always the reach that we want to see. And it's important maybe for us here, uh, who, those who are involved in the process, to, to try to extend to the uh, parliamentarian networks as much as we can, especially that, for example, in my country, they do change, so uh, when we get uh, a member of parliament on board he, the year after maybe he's not there and we have to reach to new people so um, uh, so as we're uh, quickly approaching and we have the summer uh, vacations to September for example in Africa I'm talking from the region where I come it would be great to have more information on that thank you thank you uh, we'll make sure to uh, share the invitation letter uh, the concept notes and also the practical information as soon as we have it also with the MAG members thank you and, and also, if possible, uh, the, the way back, if we get information from the parliamentarians, how can we provide that and connect the dots? And Thank you. Thank you, Amrita, for the record. And I agree to it. I have been requesting it for several years that if we can support because we need the right people in the room for example when it go and there's nothing wrong in going through the channel which is the official protocol channel but many times the people who are actually looking after it never even get it they are not even aware for example if i look at the example of india we have a parliamentary committee which looks on it they never ever got the invite so if while it is sent, if there is some other way in which we can connect you to those uh, committee chairs, etc., and if they're interested to come, because it's important for them to be in these discussions, and sometimes regulations come in, which is concerning. Sorry. Uh, yes, I know. I mean, it's a little bit difficult. We have to send it through the official channels, yes. Um, but yes, um, if we can have support from those MAG members who have contact with parliamentarians, um, that that's okay. Uh, I just wanted to just make a slight distinction. If there's MAG members with that communication to parliamentarians, yes, please. But we don't want to have uh, people who are not in the channel to start going to parliament and say, hey, I am, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, and we are very grateful for, uh, we know, you know, Amrita, yes, definitely you have those contacts, yes, and we will share that with you and we will be grateful for your help. And so, Tengita, so. it's not that we want to do it, as in we can give you the contacts. And no, no, can, no, 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 I'm saying yes, uh, we appreciate your efforts and yes, uh, we want you to do it, yes, but I'm just saying that it has to be some established link, not you are establishing the link. Yes. Uh, Matthias, uh, you had something, yes. Thank you very much, Matthias Fantinati, Mac member. I, I, I think that uh, Chengatai, we spoke a lot about my position as a, yes. mm -hmm. as a previous man, a former member of the parliamentarians, uh, uh, member of the parliament and a member of the IPU. I was both a member. And when I, I was in the IPU, so I can give you some, a bit more information about how IPU runs. That's, uh, they have a uh, 
We have uh, several committees in the IPU. One of the committees is about the digitalization. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, a, in this committee, they, they, in a sort of way, they, they schedule an, an agenda with some fixed moment of a very helpful for the parliamentarian. And, and when I was a member of the IPU, I, I just tried to, uh, to, um, to set uh, IGF like a, a fixed moment of the agenda of the IPU. I don't know that I, I am saying that because please check if uh, or somebody that you uh, can do it, if IGF is still a fixed moment in the IPU agenda. This is really important of the digitalization committee. Uh, so about my point of view about the convener parliamentarians, I think they know, or uh, you convene a parliamentarian in a formal way uh, by the UN, uh, or otherwise, uh, I I'm sorry to say, but this is what happens. It's for parliamentarians, I'm sorry to say, but the, the formality is better than the, subs than the substantials. Otherwise, it's a group of friends uh, and, uh, you know, whatever it takes. Uh, uh, I think that the best way, uh, IPU is uh, represented by the parliamentarian, just a very few numbers of the parliamentarian from each state. Uh, if you try to reach this kind of parliamentarian, there are very few for each uh, state, uh, maybe you will reach the parliamentarian just for the digitalization. So it means that uh, narrow down and narrow down again. Otherwise, if you, like a UN, that you have the, the power to do that, so if you convene in a formal way all the parliamentarian, all the president of a parliamentarian, you will have a majority and an opposition for the, uh, from the, every parliament in the world. And that's, in that point, in that point, you have a, a formal convener and a, a huge representation and, of course, a powerful representation that in order that can do something for the for the common good no, uh, thank you very much for that piece of advice and also thank you for your efforts as well they're very much appreciated and they are long lasting thank you yes um thank you very much um alhaji a member and a member of parliament um uh, I, I think we we've come a long way uh, when you look at the parliamentary track uh, actually where we started um, uh, when the IGF actually started to invite parliamentarians that were left behind since 2019 when I started, um, uh, to now that actually has led um, uh, you know, to the creation of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance, which actually brings parliamentarians together from over 25 countries. And we've made efforts actually to contact regional parliaments like the ECOWAS, which are actually on board. We've made also efforts to contact IALA, which is the East African Legislative Assembly, which is also on board, as well as the Pan-African Parliament that I also represent on the African Union. They are also on board the, the, the IGF. Now, we've also had a lot of discussion with the European Parliament in, in different forums, and also the German Parliament in particular, that we actually work together. Even until now, we organize forums online that we reach. Now, we've also tried to reach out to other African countries, probably in the north, you know, but some were not really forthcoming. Uh, but it doesn't actually stop us. We're going to continue to ensure that we bring everybody on board. Um, but I think uh, maybe what we got to do, maybe your official channel, is actually to use IPU as well. Mm -hmm. I know um, I was in one of the communications from the IPU with the African Parliament when they were also talking about um, IGF. Uh, but we were actually ahead of them because they were just starting, but we were ahead of them. So I think maybe we can continue to engage the IPU, uh, but also as a network, which is the a, you know, APNIC, we're going to also continue to, 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 you know, to expand within the African continent to ensure that everybody actually comes on board. And so far, uh, most of the regional parliaments actually are on, you know, on board with us. So we're going to continue to, to move. Uh, but I think it's also going to be good to also um, have the IPU also on board, which actually have about 179 um, you know, countries' parliaments also on board there. Yeah, the IPU. Thank you. Uh, for that. And yes, we do have um, the IPU and Celine talks reg regularly with somebody from the IPU. Oh, thanks. Nema. Um, thank you, Nema Lugangira, uh, MAG member and also member of parliament. Uh, I would like to echo what the gentleman just uh, spoke. I don't want to mispronounce your name. Um, yes, the, the IPU uh, is made up of five members of parliament from, you know, the, the, the different parliaments. And it does not necessarily guarantee that 
all of those five or some of those five are interested in digital affairs or internet governance because there's a, ra there's a range of things. So the approach that we took as the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance was the first thing was to scout for members of parliament within the continent who are interested in internet, in digital affairs, irrespective of the committee. Because one caveat that I'd like to put is, yes, you may focus on uh, ICT committees, but in some parliaments um, in Africa, you are not necessarily put in a committee because it's your area of expertise. You're put in different committees so that you can have a multi-stakeholder, multi multi-sectoral mm -hmm. overview. For example, I don't sit in the ICT committee in Tanzania. I sit in the Foreign Defense and Security Committee. So if you were to focus solely on ICT committee, then definitely you would not find me in that committee. So it's also important to understand that when we're talking about ICT, when we're talking about internet governance, it's multi-sectoral. So what we have done in the African Parliamentary Network is making sure that we have members of parliament that sit in their education committees, members of parliament that sit in health, that sit in information, that sit in infrastructure, all the different moving blocks that has an impact on internet governance, digital development, AI, etc. So similarly, um, whilst the efforts of IP are ongoing, I think one of the things that we can try and do as the IGF is to see how can we ensure that other continents learn from what Africa is doing by having an African parliamentary network on internet governance. So if we had that as well, I think it can add a lot of value because in that way, it's members of parliament organizing themselves. And this also enables us, um, even in terms of the bureaucracy, because we can reach our parliaments directly. So even in terms of the time, the, the time it takes for getting responses, the communication, et cetera. And, and then we can make sure, like what my colleague here um, just said, that when you have a parliamentary track, the members of parliament there, there's going to be a rich discussion because they're all interested in that topic, rather than just having someone there just because they're a member of parliament, but not necessarily being interested in the topic. It's like, for example, taking me to, to go talk uh, in a forum on avi aviation, for example. I'm just going to be there, but I'm not going to add value to that discussion. So I think it's very important to understand the dynamics of that. And having uh, parliamentary internet, internet governance forums is also something that, um, taking the example from the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance, we can collaborate and to see how to do the same uh, for other continents. But... To sum up, we are truly grateful for the support we're getting from the IGF Secretariat from setting up the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. And right now, as al Haji said, we have about 35 members of parliament from 24, 25 African countries who are, by the way, committed to their agenda. So much so, even when it means that sometimes we have to lose financially by not being in parliament to attend issues that are related to the topic, we do so because we carefully scouted for those who are interested and committed to the topic. So I think that can be a similar approach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nema. And yes, um, I think uh, the African Parliamentary Network is one of, is an example that we do want to replicate uh, in the Asia Pacific and also in the um, Latin American and Caribbean um, sphere as well. And thank you for that. Um, Adam, I don't know if that's supposed to be uh, Do you want to speak? Yes. If, if I may, it's, mm -hmm. um, just to say, well, first of all, it sounds like Neymar has got a um, a subtract to the parliamentary session where you evangelize about the value of the African parliamentary network and encourage your colleagues in Kyoto to do the same. So start it there and you've got, um, I think it's a, it's a brilliant idea. Um, personal experience, the IPU is not working in the way that it reaches out to parliament. I don't know where its messages go to. We were in a MAG meeting last September where we were discussing the same issue and I wrote to two parliamentarians 
on, on WhatsApp. I know in the UK they deal with IT. Um, they, while we were doing that meeting, they searched their databases and were email. They had no email about IGF, whatever, whatever, whatever. If it was in there, if they got the email, it would have been in their email boxes. It was not. Um, going back to how we can help as MAG members, very happy to do that. I and ICANN are members of a number of parliamentary forums, the United Kingdom, Europe, and so on. Um, I don't think we should be writing randomly. If you give us the information, we can either forward that because we have the existing contacts and let you know we've done it. I think it's important that we don't end up with three or four people sending the same thing, or we can introduce you so that you can do it. But maybe as we have the connection, we can do it on your behalf and CC you, but let's manage this process but let's do it and let's write to parliamentary groups that are relevant, not individual MPs. There doesn't seem much problem there. But I would, let's try and do it. And that, um, in Europe, you're now, northern countries, you're hitting the summer recess. So that's a shame. Um, and also, what happens in the United States with Congress and Senate? But that may be a specific question we don't have to answer right now. Um, but anyway, we're there to help. Tell us how to do it, but let's manage that process so that we don't end up with a weird scattershot and uh, ineffectual. Thank uh, no, thanks, Adam. And yes, uh, we should have a multi-pronged approach to this and just not um, um, go through one channel, but through many channels. And uh, as I said before, the important part is using existing channels um, uh, that are there. And if people have existing channels, yes, please do inform Celine, and we could use that. Elisa. Thank you, uh, Chengatai. Um, on the parliamentar par parliamentary sessions, um, I saw on the schedule that there's a parliamentary roundtable. Um, I guess uh, parliamentarians will be sitting um, amongst each other um, and discussing um, all these interesting topics. But how do we, or in which um, broad events do we ensure that parliamentarians engage with other stakeholder groups? Um, will there also be a, in the parliamentary track, a session in which they are kind of nudged really to engage with civil society um, the tech community, um, um, because I, I really think that that's a very important top, uh, aspect of coming to the IGF and discussing um, or hearing from, uh, from civil society on what their concerns are. Um, yeah. Um. Thank you, Elisa. Um, mm. So just for you to know, the round tables, they are open uh, to, to everyone. So it's not only going to be for, for members of parliament. And um, we've received uh, several times feedback from uh, various members of parliament that they would actually like to be uh, more involved in the uh, rest of the IGF. In the invitation letters, we're already um, really encouraging them to take part in other um, uh, sessions of the IGF and what we would try to do this time is also have them as uh, speakers in other sessions that are not related to the parliamentary track if this answers your question thank you just a couple of things that I forgot uh, I would like to give you my experience as a member of the parliament just to in order to correct some aspects I think that uh, uh, how a parliamentarian uh, feels when he received uh, a, a letter from the IGF. That consider that uh, in the Italian parliament, uh, I, it was just me that I only received the mail of the IGF and I, I, I was a MAG member. And when I, I try to just to encourage my colleagues to come with me to the IGF, that you have to consider one, one aspect that uh, uh, we received 10 invitation for a lot of meetings and whatever, 10 per day uh, around the world. And that's why I should uh, choose uh, IGF instead of something else. Uh, I think that uh, uh, one of the possible issues, was the possible uh, reason, is because uh, um, 
I, in IGF, I, I have a, a space of mine. Because if you consider that I am a, a parliamentarian, so my aim is to be voted. And my, uh, and my um, constituency is not in Japan. And yeah, I, I will try to speak very clearly because we have to try to uh, engage as many members of the parliamentarians as possible. So if I have some reason to go there, because the topics are interesting, in a, is my, uh, I mean, for my job, and I mean, that I learned some the, about the human, digital human rights, digital artificial intelligence, and there's a lot, and consider there's a, a lot of me, uh, events of digital, uh, of digital intelligence and human rights. So why IGF? So I go back home, uh, and with this, my new knowledge, uh, I can just uh, uh, inspire in my government and my uh, civil society. That can work. Otherwise, if I came to IGF and I just, talk with a lot of parliamentarians with no, with uh, gain nothing. Why should I come? And that is what is happening. Honestly, I, I don't know if I, I have to tell you, but I, I, I really feel uh, free to, to say something, just to correct our action in order to engage as many parliamentarians as possible. And also, uh, to st this, I, I know that I keep insisting on that to have a mandate to come to EGF, but this is, a reason. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you how it works in Italy and in Europe. I don't know if it works in the same way in Africa and another continent. But uh, if you have to stay away for your parliament for one week, because we are talking about one week, just going and going back, you have to you have to have a reason for for your parliament to stay away. Otherwise, there's no reason why you go to the Japan to stay in an event that's yeah. There are a lot of events. I could stay away, travel around the world for all one year if I have to attend the, all the meetings that I, I have been invited when I am a member of the parliament. But if you have a formal mandate, is a reason because you are recognized by your parliament and you are, you are justified to stay away from your parliament. This is an important reason. And that's why most of the European parliament don't come to IGR. Because I spoke to a lot of my colleagues, even in a uh, colleague in France, in, uh, in Germany, as to why don't you go to IGF. And the reason is what's most of this reason. So we have to try to correct, to improve uh, our message and our, uh, our tool to, to engage as many parliamentarians. I expect a lot there, there will be a lot of parliamentarians of Japan, of our, our country, and a lot of parliamentarians of Asia. But uh, if we cut doing this way, we have we, 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 we won't have a lot of parliamentarians around the world. This is my, my, my 1%. Yeah. Um, I had somebody online, but they seem to have disappeared. So then we'll have Alhaji, Nema, Bruna, then Carol. Um, yes, um, th thank you. Um, I think the, the, the messaging is actually um, quite important, and maybe this is for Celine. You know, you know, when you, in the parliaments, we, we have committees that actually drive our work. So, for example, in our own parliament in Gambia, I'm the chairperson of the Committee on, on, on Education and Technology. So essentially, because I grew up in the tech world, so, so for me, it's, it's, it's just a natural flow that I actually have. But then if you go to other countries, actually, that's not the same way, because we have uh, the Committee on Technology, maybe none of them actually has any background in technology. So I think what we've got to be targeting is the committees on technology and digital innovation. So, so, so that would actually help us. So maybe that's for Celine. When you deal with IPU also, when they send information, invitation, it must be directed to the committee handling those, those areas, whether it's the African Parliament, whether you know, it's the European Parliament. So, so I think we, we're going to be in a much better you know, position to go directly to the committee that's responsible instead of just a general invitation. The general invitation actually is not going to get anywhere because who is, here, who is interested in going? But if it is addressed directly to the committee that's responsible, like in the African Parliament also, I'm on the Committee on, on Science, Technology, and Innovation, it comes to our committee. And last day, we actually sent representation to the, to, to, to the IGF in Ethiopia. So let's target also the committees in the respective countries' parliament dealing with technology and innovation. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to echo what, what, what is being said. And in terms of... I think it's, it's all parliaments whereby um, a, a member of parliament cannot just up and go, especially, you know, out, out of the country. 
unfortunately or fortunately we are kind of we are public owned so our speakers need to give us mandates irrespective whether in, in, in session or not um, for going forward so again I, I go back to the same point that um, having uh, parliamentary internet governance networks is 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 a big solution in most of these things that we're discussing because speakers would know that ABC MPs are members of a certain network. So that also helps in a lot of the communications, but also it helps in internal communications. But one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, of, of at least Global South members of parliament participating is the issue of travel. Because most of our parliaments are not going to cover the travel costs. And, uh, you know, I commend the IGF Secretariat. They give a lot of travel support. But, for example, I think the travel um, support deadline was yesterday or today. Or it's, or it's coming up the, for the travel support. But if, but if until this point, many, uh, I'm not sure how many African parliamentarians already have the information and how that information has been spread amongst the parliamentarians, you may find that by the time someone knows of it, the time for applying travel support is over. So they, so they could be an opportunity also for the IGF to discuss with you know, other partners on how to increase the pool of travel support, uh, but also through the networks, we can also support um, to spreading the news and uh, spreading the news and even the links to the letters, the general letters, et cetera. I think that, that can also be done. Um, as a concluding point, which is different, it's off, off topic, but it's kind of related. Um, in October, there is the election of IPU presidency. And uh, my speaker, the Tanzanian uh, speaker, uh, Right Honorable Tulia Axon, is vying for IPU presidency. So cross fingers, if she wins, then perhaps the IPU relations are going to be very smooth. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm asking all of you to, you know, get, get us votes for Tulia Axon. Thank you. Right. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. So I've got now Bruna, Carol, Bram, and Yahoo, uh, who's online. Uh, so Bruna. Thanks, Shingutai. No, just going back to the point about us helping um, feed the list on parliamentarians, I think as much as IPU might be a relevant effort, I, I do also think that we happen to have some collective knowledge about our local scenarios and the power imbalances, such as the questions and things like that. And I still I mean, I know this is, it's not the IGF's place to understand whether a parliamentarian comes from a far-right party, but we did have um, a far-right Brazilian parliamentarian back at the Brilliant IGF, and she even used her participation here to target myself and other civil society members, um, which was funny, but um, part of the game as well. But at the same time, I, I think just um, that once we have this list more or less consolidated, it, it would be good to just to see whether anyone from the MAC would like to have like a second look and just like try, not that we're gonna veto anyone, but maybe we can bring in um, new names from different perspectives and things like that. Because I, I happen to agree with the discussion between Mattia and, and Nema. It's not just the ICT committees, but the ones working with democracy, the ones working with um, a lot of issues related to gender or even human rights or the justice and, and um, justice systems committees and things like that, that can also be relevant. So we can help with that. And um, last but not least, I do know, happen to know that the IPU outreaches to the chair of the, the lower house in Brazil, which is somebody that's um, beyond um, busy and everything else. So that's probably why sometimes the invitations are not getting to, to the targeted um, parliamentarians, so maybe we can also see whether we can have additional contacts um, in the local parliaments we are inviting people from, and, um, and once again, I can I can help it um, with Brazilian, with the Brazilian case because I've been working on that recently. So that's all. Thank you very much, Bruna. Um, and yes, we will keep with a uh, multi-pronged approach. Uh, Carol, yes, I just want to uh, um, add that. When you, when you talk about Carol Roach farmers, uh, parliamentarians, uh, you, especially with technology, you know, I, I tell people as soon as you, or people see me sometimes, the parliamentarians, their eyes roll back because they say, oh, she's come to talk about technology. 
So what you have to do is to really use, as Audrey is saying, an approach that is not um, a technology appro approach to, um, to them. It has to be something that will um, inspire them to leave or, or to choose IGF over, over something, um, some other conference or staying at home to do to, to, um, the work of the country. So I'm just supporting um, what was said previously and they, they do need sufficient time in order to plan to go. Uh, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, Bram? No, thank you. Um, so I just wanted also to echo the point of uh, who, who get to be invited or where do we direct the communication? Uh, I'm getting two messages. <clears throat> so there's one end you have, um, you know, the request to have the communications channeled through the proper, or I mean the IPO, but uh, even within the subcommittee, so uh, communications or legal, um, taking into account that IGF issues, um, I, th I think um, Nema pointed out that fact. Are there, and, and this maybe goes to the parliamentarians, are there inter, inter committee sort of uh, communications, you know, if the sub themes, for example, this year border around issues of uh, legal, you know, ethics, to sort of extend these invitations beyond just within the communications committee so that we have equal representation from, from both members of, uh, of, of, of parliament? And then <clears throat> the other issue that I wanted also to, to highlight was. Um, I think um, he pointed out from, from the Italy perspective that the challenge also sometimes is uh, how the message is actually packaged. When you're inviting a parliamentarian, they're asking a question, what, why, why must I travel to, to, to Japan, for example? What is, what is it so important? Is it to do with us packaging, uh, you know, after we've selected the, the themes and, and, and what, what needs to be discussed? How are we packaging that invitation down to the parliamentarians for them to actually contextualize it and localize it to relate to the problems that they are facing in their constituents? Because there are the same problems. When we're discussing human rights issues, um, issues of connectivity, access, they are impacted in their constituencies. It is just, I think, a matter of how they are packaged and passed on and inviting them to this kind of conversation so that they see the relevance for them to be part of the conversation. Thank you. No, thank you for that. And I don't know if it's too late for this year, but uh, we will be consulting with the parliamentarians within the MAG as well. Uh, that might help with the messaging. I think that'd be good. Um, I have Yahoo online. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but. Um... Thank you very much. Can I, can I throw? Yes, please. Thank you very much for the floor. It's Yahoo. I'm of the Dynamic Coalition on the uh, Data Driven and Health Technology, and also you've had here from Benin. Yeah, I was not uh, from the beginning the discussion on the parliamentary track for the IGF, but I want, just want to share my experience with that, with that because I have a friend who is a member of the parliament in Benin. I've tried to uh, convince her to join the IGF in the parliamentary track, and one of the Difficulties I noticed in the reply she was giving is that actually she needed to get a mandate from the Speaker of the House before she could travel. And before that to happen, they need to be informed. And then if the information is not coming from the organizers of the IGF, that would be difficult for her to convince because we don't really have like a, a committee in the parliamentary. Uh, House in Berlin, which is tackling the issue of internet government, for example. We have committee. I also have experience, like in most African countries, we have committee on ITC and, and human rights, but no committee, committee for say, tackling the issue of the internet governance. So my suggestion, I think the uh, Honorable Speaker name also stressed that is that we need to I will, I will advise the IGF, if I may, that uh, the organizers that we try to highlight the benefits of uh, uh, each parliamentary member joining the IGF, but also try to make it possible that the speakers of 
reach out uh, in different parts of the world. Like if possibility uh, there are for reaching out to them, we might explore those possibilities so that officially each house uh, of representatives got the information. I know it's huge work to do, but I assume also there might be a possibility to have a, a shortcut to do that if through the regional uh, parliamentary houses that's, and so on. So it is also the possibility, I think someone also suggested that in the chat that since the IGF is a hybrid option, we can also have it uh, the parliamentary track as an hybrid, particip hybrid participation, so that to gain uh, insight from different uh, parliamentary members from different uh, parts of the world, so that they know actually what is how the IGF about. That is not only about talking about tech, but it's also about policy making. They are a policy maker for say so to engage them in the, in the discussion and also uh, make it easier so that next uh, IGF, we might have uh, more representative from House of Representatives and they have mandate for the speaker from their speakers and then they can actively participate and engage in different um, uh, activities. Of course, they can also be speakers now if they are highly engaged earlier. But yeah, that's why I just wanted to at this comment to the discussion. Thank you very much for the floor. Uh, thank you for your comments. And um, just to let you know, uh, yes, um, that is part of our collaboration with um, the IPU that an invitation letter gets sent to the speakers of the House of each um, parliament, uh, which is signed by the um, IPU and also UNDESA. And um, from what you're from the reports that I'm getting that sometimes it either doesn't actually get there or it doesn't get read um, for one reason or another. So yes, so we're gonna be trying this multi-pronged approach. But I would also want to also state that we also do have a parliamentary mailing list and the parliamentary track is not just a one-time event at the IGF annual meeting, but we do have a lot of intersessional activities. Um, so another way is to get interested parliamentarians to sign up to the mailing to the parliamentary um, mailing list. Um, but thank you all for those inputs. I mean, uh, they are very um, useful to us. And I'll just give Celine the last word. Uh, I just wanted to thank you also for, for all the feedback. I think it's very important um, to also have a successful parliamentary track. Um, we're definitely going to reach out to you um, after we send out the invitation letters uh, via the IPU. And uh, one thing that I just wanted to, to let you know is in the invitation letter, we are actually directing um, the invitees to share this invitation letter with um, uh, members of parliament who also are um, dealing with digital affairs and ICT, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that would, be, that would be it from my side. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. If the chair allows, we will have um, NRI. NRI it is. Mm. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I will share a couple of information about the youth track and the newcomers track, just updating uh, from what's been said in March during the open, first open consultations, and I'll just share a few slides. Oh, sorry, yes, my mistake. It's the youth track yes. and the newcomers track. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, but the NRIs do feature the tracks, yes, so I'll, <laughs> I'll make a bridge. Thank you. So. Uh, you know that the concept of the IGSU track is about cybersecurity and trust. The motto is Save Digital Future. And the IGF Secretariat works with um, quite a large group of youth IGF coordinators, which are delegated by their multi stakeholder organizing committees to channel the inputs from their communities and youth priorities to the Secretariat. The structure of the youth track is that there are four capacity development workshops, which are 
designed by this group uh, together with us as well as implemented in cooperation with the regional IGFs. So the first one was actually hosted not, not a long time ago, on 19th of June at Eurodig. And uh, MAG members certainly are one of the greatest sources of knowledge for us. Uh, a former MAG member, Jutta Kroll, was an uh, active participant of the first workshop at Eurodig, which was focusing on youth mental health, together with a number of young people. The upcoming one will be at the um, uh, youth LAC IGF in Cartagena in Colombia, um, and then we will have an, the third one at the Youth Asia Pacific IGF, which will be in Brisbane in Australia, and then we will conclude the set of workshops with the fourth one hosted in uh, Abuja, Nigeria at the African IGF, and you see that the topics will relate to capacity development um, in cybersecurity, to trust and human rights aspects, as well as to artificial uh, intelligence from the aspect of uh, trust building. The outcomes, outputs of all these workshops feed into the IGF 2023 Global Youth Summit, which will be hosted at day zero of the IGF in Kyoto, so on 8th of October. The whole idea, as you know, about the youth track is that this is not just young people organizing sessions from the, for themselves and speaking to young people about youth issues. This is about a dialogue between the current generation of experts and leaders and the next generation of experts and leaders. And so that's why the workshop at Eurodig really took the form of a dialogue between young people, but also senior experts um, on the topic, and the following workshops will do the same. The um, Youth Summit as well will be a dialogue between these two targeted groups. And as my colleague Celine said, uh, we are very much keen on creating co strong cooperation between the parliamentary track and the youth track. Uh, and uh, that's been very, really nicely received by our youth IGF coordinators who are part of this organizing group of the youth track. So just next week, I believe we have our uh, next regular monthly call to uh, finalize on the planning of the uh, these two workshops, uh, the well, three workshops that I've just mentioned, as well as the Global Youth Summit. And I hope that uh, by the end of this month, we will have a concrete concept note for the youth, for all the workshops plus the Youth Summit, and that will definitely be shared with the MAG. The work is open to everyone, and of course, we really welcome the engagement of MAG members um, in any in any role. Uh, and uh, any ideas are, are welcome. As you know, modus operandi is a standard one of the IGF. We have a dedicated mailing list, two lists. We also meet regularly, monthly. Now we're, we will meet more than uh, once a month because of the three workshops which are very closely hosted. There are also newsletter updates in our regular newsletter. You've noticed the section on youth track. And then we will introduce uh, webinars closer to the meeting date in Kyoto, uh, just to inform young people about all the activities that are happening there. I will just quickly circle back to our discussions in March. There was a really good um, suggestion from some of the MAG members that we could maybe introduce some form of mentorship program, or at least some form of cooperation with those implications uh, between this maybe group that's organizing the youth track and the MAG members. Um, certainly, this is for your consideration. I've informed the youth uh, track organizers. They mostly welcome this idea. Maybe something concretely could be, given the timeline that's very tight, something concretely could be done with respect to preparing the main sessions, which is for the MAG uh, members as facilitators of the main session to extend cooperation, um, invitation for cooperation to this youth group. The IGF Secretariat will um, do its best as last year to also engage this group further, deeper into the program of the IGF because engaging the coordinators means that you are engaging the broader communities. They are basically channeling all the inputs. The way we are doing that is, for example, that there is the um, there is the uh, list of all the youth IGF coordinators, uh, which is publicly available. It's been shared a couple of times with all the uh, session proposers during the um, call for session um, time. And some of them did indeed consider engaging some of the youth IGF coordinators in their sessions. We will continue sharing this list now with the approved session organizers with the idea to hopefully include um, at least these young people or others through them 
uh, in their sessions in various roles. So those roles, they don't necessarily have to be speaking roles. They can be some supporting roles as resource persons, as moderators on site or online, as rapporteurs or anything else that you think would be useful for the sessions. So hopefully maybe for the main sessions we could, um, we could discuss perhaps um, this cooperation. Uh, and then I will move quickly to the newcomers track. So the newcomers track uh, has been launched as part of the capacity development um, strategy of the IGF in 2016. So this is what you see on the screen. This is actually the very first session that's been hosted at the IGF in Mexico, in Guadalajara. And since then, we've been uh, implementing it, designing it. it uh, its form was maybe changing, evolving over time. But now it has a more fixed form in the past couple of years, which is to um, introduce um, some informational materials before the annual meeting takes place for those who are participating on site for the first time in the annual meeting. And the reason why we're really insisting on on-site participation is because you have so many stakeholders, participants who are participating online, but they don't have experience of on-site participation, which I'm sure you will agree is, is different and can be very complex to navigate the whole uh, concept of the IGF. So uh, through the registration, because the registration uh, data do ask whether you are attending the, um, the IGF annual meeting for the first time, we reach out to all those participants and then we engage them into our processes to inform them about everything that's happening and to equip them with enough skills to navigate the process and the meeting. So there's a dedicated mailing list. There's also an um, informational page that we put on the IGF website every year. Uh, we plan again to introduce uh, hosting one webinar for the newcomers maybe later in September, in second half of September. Um, and then we will uh, host again a traditional orientational session, uh, usually hosted at the morning of day zero or morning of day one, depending what schedule allows. And that's the, um, that's the session that focuses uh, on the structure of the IGF, on the thematic structure as well. And usually it's delivered by the secretariat and by the MAG through the MAG chairs role. So all the past MAG chairs have been involved in this. And that's the whole idea. There's a timeline uh, on the side which I hope you can see. In any case, so we're basically working continuously on uh, engaging those who register for the IGF in uh, Kyoto, saying that they are attending for the very first time. Um, the informational page should be ready in August, as soon as we have um, all confirmed on the international work on the sessions. And then, as I mentioned, the, the webinar and the orientational session will be hosted later, so as of, as of second half of September. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anya. Uh, Amrita, for the records, and I have definitely seen the youth uh, tracks working pretty actively in this. In terms of the MAG uh, involvement, when, you know, we start working in the main sessions, and this had come up in our working group strategy also, when the youth presented that they would also like to come mainstream into the discussions. Perhaps what we could uh, suggest is uh, when we have the discussions uh, while formulating for the main um, themes, etc., as we have others from the community participating, youth could also be encouraged to be part of those dialogues. Uh, if there is anything else specifically you would like the MAG members to be involved in, I think most of us would be happy to be involved. And there was a question, like, you have a fellowship which is given to people. Uh, is there any particular thing you are looking at it from the MAG perspective that we would, we, you need us as mentors for those fellows or something? Uh, perhaps that could be a value add, especially for new people. It may be a stretch for us, uh, but I guess we can do that if required. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Amrita. Maybe I just can quickly respond. Probably you mean on this call for travel support that, that, yes, indeed, that's part also of the capacity development strategy. The call is open to eligible candidates until end of today, UTC. So this is the last day, and I've just looked at the numbers. We have close to, I think, 700 applications already. Uh, I think that's a very good idea if the MAG has capacity. There are many, uh, not just newcomers who register through that call for travel support and eventually are granted, 
but also those who are just interested to who hold expertise and are interested to be more integrated into the program and they maybe face some challenges how to do that so we welcome ideas to come from the mag we will probably not give any ideas depending what's your capacity but certainly more support to those granted um, supported candidates is uh, is needed thank you uh, thank you, Nema Lugangira, a MAG member. I just wanted to commend uh, the efforts, and as, as parliamentarians, we very much welcome the, the opportunity of youth having direct engagement uh, with members of parliament, because oftentimes that's an engagement that they lack. And even through that engagement, we can perhaps also provide them capacity building on how to engage parliamentarians in their own um, respective countries. Uh, but I believe other nitty-gritty details on how it can be arranged, uh, what sort of focus is, you know, what should we focus on, etc. Perhaps those are discussions that we can brainstorm together with the IGF Secretary, but it's a very, um, very good thing and I think a needed one. So, yeah, I commend it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shengeda. I, I think I also wanted to uh, echo what Neymar was saying. Uh, I think the Secretary is already doing quite a lot, but I wanted to find out if we, especially for the newcomers, are, are there any ways in, in where we, after they have been in, inserted into the IGF uh, space, um, you know, some sort of a mailing list where we're able to follow through and, and uh, you know, mentorship continues. Um, uh, I think as MAG member, I, I remember this conversation was also uh, brought in last year in terms of coming in the space and uh, building capacity. But I think I wanted to find out if, if that is something that, or are they already uh, automatically um, signed into a particular mailing list uh, that sort of keeps them updated on the conversations uh, even after their uh, first IGF meeting. Thank you. Yes, if a journalist may qualify at least as newcomer, I already like to bring informally my input. I saw that among the tracks or topics was data management. Last week at the AI for Good forum, we heard the complaint that we have so much data, too much data, but not centralized, not synthesized. So my worry as a journalist or newcomer is why after one third of a century of the existence of the internet are we still stuck in that situation? And can the situation be improved, data centralized, synthesized, without choking freedom of ideas and imposing uh, mainstream gospel. Yeah, thank you very much, Anya, for the summary. And um, I, I, I was just wondering whether you could also broaden um, the group um, with regard to the uh, uh, mentoring um, program that you could also include former MAC members so that you have a broader base for that. And then uh, I just wanted to also <laughs> Uh, um, stress out one point that that I find very um, important to consider also to have a permanent MAC position seat for for a youth representative. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for all your ideas. I think they're very good and uh, feasible in terms of the of the implementation. So I'll just respond to these concrete questions like from, from Bram. There is the newcomers mailing list. So we do reach out to all the newcomers and ask them to subscribe to that mailing list. But then after they go through this um, structure of the newcomers track, then we encourage them to subscribe to all the mailing lists depending on what's their interest and that they continue to engage in, in those processes. So that can be any mailing list of the intersectional work, the NRIs, dynamic coalitions, uh, or the parliamentary track in case they are parliamentarians, uh, and so on. Um, in terms of um, the questions from, uh, from Boris, certainly any stakeholder group, any stakeholder, individual, organization can qualify as a newcomer, 
Uh, and so journalists are definitely not an exception to there. We certainly see press media as very important stakeholder group and uh, maybe we can also discuss bilaterally how can we provide better orientation for media and press that are interested to engage more in the IGF and to help us to elevate the role of the IGF. Our communication expert is also here, so perhaps that could be a good, uh, good discussion if you would have time. But thank you very much. On the topics, I do understand your concern of data, but that's something that maybe also can be taken uh, offline. And hopefully at the IGF in Kyoto, many of the sessions of data will be, will be hosted there. Thank you. And then also finally to just respond to Suki's very good uh, proposal. I think that's a very good idea and I did mention at the beginning the, the MAG as a whole, not just the currently serving MAG members but also alumni, that's why I mentioned Utah, it are very, very important to us. Uh, so maybe we can indeed formalize it somehow to give it the form and encourage the former MAG members to be more active with this mentorship group. But I do think that it would be really helpful to us to understand what this mentorship could be about and what can we do, especially given the fact that we are technically two months away from the um, IGF in Kyoto, effectively speaking. So uh, ideas on that, but maybe for next year we have more time to prepare a more robust uh, process on that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Elisa for the record. Um, just one very brief comment on the mailing lists. Um, I'm on a few mailing lists and I always feel like when I get an email on that mailing list, 2005 cold, because the interface of that mailing list is just awful. Is there something that we can do to improve that interface and also make it a bit more appealing to newcomers or others? Um, um, yeah, it's just, it's been a, something that I, that's been bothering me for some time. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Lisa. We'll look into that. Um, uh, Lewis is not here, but yes, we'll look into that. Adam. Hi, thank you. Uh, Anya, thanks very much for all the updates. Um, just a quick sort of observation comment about youth. Um, can you sort of encourage them to, <laughs> to talk about youth perspectives on these issues? Because the point is that what is their experience that might be different from an old git like me? Um, we don't need them to be, we need to hear from them what is their experience, what is their perspective. I'm afraid too often in youth sessions, it, it sounds like just younger, less experienced people talking about policy. To, and I don't mean that in a rude way. I'm saying that we're missing out on their experience and perspective. What is the experience of using digital technologies? Does it differ from my experience? Um, what is their experience of privacy and the use of data, their data, the way that they're experiencing their lives? Um, I, you know, we don't really need them. To, that's what we need from them, please. So, you know, what are we missing and not understanding? Because uh, it's, it's their society we're talking about really, when we're talking about information society. Thanks. I thought there's a place they, 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 they always buy. I think there's somebody ah. speaking on the, on the online room, but no, just about the youth perspectives. I, it is, it is, it is. <laughs> but I, I think there was an overlapping with the online audio and everything else. But just on the youth, I, I agree with Adam. Um, maybe we need um, some sort of a new approach in this because <laughs> I do feel that um, it's very often that they are closed in their own silos, just asking and discussing like how to change the world, which is sometimes very interesting and, and like like helps um, shine a light in a lot of the discussions. But we need to break the silos um, to some extent. So I don't know, maybe in the parliamentarian track, there is a way of hosting kind of a side chat conversation between one of the youth leaders and one parliamentarian on relevant policy issues surrounding internet governance or anything like that, but maybe we can explore some additional model of a session that would bridge kind of these two fields of expertise and um, like put the different perspectives and experiences in the same room so we can have a, a better um, chat about that. Uh, thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, before I give it to Anya to say the last word. I just wanted to say, um, can we take a group photo 
um, when we break for lunch, we can just take a group photo. Uh, I think that would be great. Okay. <clears throat> Just once again, a big thank you. I took notes, I think, of all the concrete proposals that came here from this room, also online. I see on the chat some ideas. Uh, and then we will see at the Secretariat how to turn this into something that's pragmatical to do for Kyoto. Uh, and then hopefully have a concrete maybe vision what we want to achieve for next year when we will have more time. So you will hear from us. Thank you very much. Lunch break. Yes, back at three, three, please. I think let's take it now. And um, I'm not too sure where the best place is. either just go outside here and have a group photo? I don't know. Yeah. Um, whichever. I don't, I have no idea. I don't have the eyes. I, 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 I saw you move it to a very good spot. Yes. I said, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me join her. Yes. Tall, 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 people to the back. Tall, tall people at the back. Short people, you yes. know your place. Yes. <laughs> Short people, you know your place. No, you should go on the back. <laughs> Maybe Chris. Chris. Yeah. I think you should be here. <laughs> yes. You can move this back. Yes. So that we can we can do this. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
So she's the photographer or? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we need to curve a bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you need to turn sideways. Front row. Wait, hold on. Where is he? Everybody in the front row, move to the left a bit, please. Because we're too bunched up on the right. Just move to the left. Can you move? And turn sideways. You have to turn sideways. Oh, gosh, do I need to come around? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I can't tilt. I know we No, wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Wait. No, my eyes are closed. Really, shake it eye. My eyes are closed. Yes. Okay. We do it again. Yes, because yeah, my eyes are closed just now. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> we will still see him, don't yeah. worry. <laughs> He's yeah. tall enough. Can you see me? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, okay. Amongst the tall people. Yes. yes. There you go. Oh, no, I was looking. Okay. <laughs> okay, again. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.
あそうなん
政府内だからね、そのえっと、見せ方にもよるし、生のものをそのまま渡せるかどうかにもよるし、その政府内で議論する数の一般論があると思うんだけど、普通政府の問題ではないかもしれない。普通に集めて、みんなほとんどの人が意見を出して、その意見をなんとかそれをまとめて返すのに、政府から政府がそれをやるっていう、そういった中で、議論に誤解する、誤解する。だから、その上でその議論をすると、議論をするとしても、その議論をすると、行動の簡単さの中に理解しているときに、理解の中にするとか、それとその合法、大統領の関係は議論の中の中で、それだけじゃなくていいんじゃないかと、その時に、その情報の中でどういうふうに言ってるか、大統領の中に本当にやってないって、どんな考えを持っているのか、こういう方向に行ったらいいのか、どういうのをやってるかというと、まあ、そうしますと、ただ、普通の中身は、やっぱり、その、政府内内に、これとこれを言うだけじゃなくて、議員は、まあ、えっと、プラス、半分、あるし、その、面倒くささが違うし
ったら、なんかそんなことあったような気がしたりするような感じで、実はない。
Um, I'm so I'm 
Yeah. yeah, fine. Thank you very much for yesterday. Yeah. Oh yeah, I heard somebody said seven. Yeah, yeah, but it's the eight, right? Eight, yeah. It is, yeah. okay. Yeah. So it's on the actual basis. Actually, it's eight, yes. Yeah. 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 
and yeah. the city is not decided yet uh, whether in the morning or in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, I will try to keep uh, knowing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Excellent. And um, I guess this is what we'll have to for the report. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, sure. Also looking for it. Uh, where should I look? <laughs> like at you or like that I'm speaking?
Uh, thank you very much, colleague, and thank you very much, uh, Chengatai, for for let me speak. Uh, just yeah, I will take just five minutes because it's my last here in the MAGA member. Uh, just five minutes. Just, I will give you some my point of view about the agenda. Thanks for letting me to do it. Um, this is my last year as a MAG member, and just throwing around, uh, I saw uh, there's a universal declaration of human rights. And truth to be told, I realized that uh, we have to be honest. We are a group of friends. There are some countries that don't respect human rights, and some countries are, more or less. But what I'm seeing here, there's a lot of people, a lot of colleagues, uh, the law respect the human rights, and, uh, and I really think that the future must be brighter for our world. Why I'm say that? Because it's my last here, this is my, of my mandate of, for the MAG member. I would like to hug uh, you all uh, because, uh, and to give you my, my legacy about what I heard here in MAG. I would like to hug uh, just a bit more of the people that have, is uh, the last uh, mandate uh, as mine. And I would like to really thank you all at for running for running this mag uh, with, uh, with a lot of efforts that we all know what you, uh, how it's very difficult to, to run the mag member. And I would like to really to say a, a special thank you to a person that's in the back office. And, but it's, a, it's my point of view, and I'm sorry to say that, is the one of the best person that I met here at the UN, is Anya Gengo, that she's in the back office and, uh, and uh, he made a, uh, uh, he always present with us, and uh, he made uh, one of the Italian IGF, one of the best I IGF that we have. And we, he's always present. Uh, he's, he's in the back office, and she, she made a, a marvelous work. Thank you very much, really personally, and in the name of Italian IGF. That, uh, and I hope really that this is not a, I don't speak, no, it's not for me, it's for her. Because, and, and I hope really that uh, Adam, Pick, Adam Speak is not here, but. Uh, I know that I can really found just uh, all the IGF, and I hope that for the next year we'll, I can will found the IGF Italian as well because we need money. We need not money. Excuse me. We need funds. Yeah. Uh, just just to say that uh, we are a member, and we bear a lot of effort, a lot of cost to come here every year, all around the world, and sometimes it's not very easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, I know that I wanted to prove to the right. Uh, you know, I am an outspoken. You know, I, I do apologize in advance uh, as we made some uh, uh, arguments for the Italian for, uh, uh, for the parliamentarian track. And I would like to uh, to give you a, a couple of suggestions that I would like to put on the record. Maybe uh, we are thinking we are an incredible group and very skilled person here. But we need a, a bit more knowledge of that. We are appointed, we are nominated. And I, honestly, I'm proud to be a MAG member. And there's nothing to say, I'm very proud. And just, I do a lot of effort in Italy to be a MAG member, I'm proud. I put on my CV as well. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think that uh, just uh, a wish for the next MAG chair, and I would like to thank Paul for, uh, for this especially work that he, he did and he's kept doing. But I would like that the next MAG member is one among us, among the MAG member, one of the currently MAG member, because the next MAG member must know how the MAG runs, uh, MAG chair, excuse me, must know how the MAG runs and all the difficulties that MAG have. And I think that in, just in this case can improve the MAG. Because that, that's what we need. We need we just uh, we uh, rebrand the IGF brand. We need to uh, be more accountability. So we have to improve and to recognize just a little more the MAG and all the members of the MAG that they do a lot of effort to do it. This is my request. And I have a second one request that I really zip it. Uh, this is, uh, honestly, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm really keen on, on transparency and in participation. And that's what is UN does, and that was is uh, the, our group make stronger than the other one. But, there is a but. Uh, we are MAG member, we are an appointed, we are proud to be. And I think, uh, out, outspoken, 
and I really hope to not find anybody. That observer must be observer. In order that uh, we are uh, a transparent meetings, a transparent choices, but we are a member and uh, we, are, uh, we know them how the mag. I think that we can't just read a bit more than the other one for the UN process. And those several must be offered. I, I, I really hope that uh, nobody gets offended. Uh, for in a, next, a couple of months after Tokyo, I will be an observer. And all the things that uh, I could say, I, I, that, that's now the time. And I'm sorry if I, this is not the proper uh, right agenda, but uh, it's something that I have to say. Thank you very much, but I would like to put in a vote, and I would like that uh, if, uh, if this, my suggestion will be changed and will be improved, just a bit the MAG process and the IGF, I would be very, very glad and very, very proud. Thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you very much, Matea, and it was a pleasure working with you as well, and also your efforts with the parliamentary track. Um, I think you're the person who led it, um, the first parliamentarian that we actually engaged with, and uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, you're still a MAG member, so no farewells yet. <laughs> so I'll hand it over to the chair to start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you and congratulations for your service as well. Um, so now we come to the part of the program where, which is focused on the intersessional activities. And I'm going to invite those who were responsible to share the updates. And starting with the Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. I think we may be missing some people who have gone next door. Is there a party? No, there's a, a session led by uh, one of the, uh, well, the LP members are next door <laughs> holding a private session. I'm, I'm not too sure exact, the exact details of that session. Um, okay, because we've got Karina. Josephine, yes, would you like to say, oh, Karina, are you going to say? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, this is for the um, Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it's on? Okay, perfect. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, Karina Virada, MAG member for the records, co facilitators, uh, Best Practice Forum uh, on Cybersecurity. I should be. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I share best practice forum on cybersecurity mark update uh, today. Objectives and work plans for 2023. Collect and evaluate cybersecurity events to present. First person data tip from those most affected as victims of first responders to those involved in policy and norms developing deliberations so that high-level policies decisions are grounded in reality. Cybersecurity incidents, human security effect, expectation of responsibility, uh, cyber behavior norm or, and policies. And in the middle, the questions, how we do that? May to soon update um, in the code number one, work plan and methodology discussions, um, ICF community survey, um, community invited to review long list of events, and in the call number two, consolidation and short list of events. 
shortlist and research questions. Uh, well, in the best fighting for cybersecurity 2023, in tend to collect narratives from those most affected in cybersecurity incidents, as deems uh, on the first recommender to present their experience to those involved in policies and not deliberation. This is the short list of even the most popular incidents and the research question that we are recollected, what was the impact on people? What was the impact on CI and CII? What was the impact on government services? What was the impact on technical infrastructure? And what the, was the impact responder? Uh, how did the incident affect international peace and stability relation between the state? And uh, now continues Justin. Please, thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, next slide. Okay. Yeah, so between June and October, we plan to have a um, call for volunteers. Uh, during this time, we'll have teams of volunteers working on deep dive analysis. Um, and this would help in terms of uh, formulating um, discussions and findings that will be presented during uh, the IGF 2023. And this um, report will bring experiences of people who've been affected by uh, cyber incidents um, and those involved in discussing and developing high level norms and policies intended to avoid and address future cyber security incidents. Uh, here is where we call upon the IGF community uh, also uh, within your different spaces. Uh, we are putting, we'll have a call for volunteers and these are very crucial in terms of um, the work that needs to happen between now and October. Uh, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to get um, volunteers uh, so that uh, they could access uh, supporters in assessing uh, the victims or the victims, uh, the cases uh, in terms of the victims and first respondents. Uh, they'll also assess places where the their experiences are narrated and information in different languages. Um, so NRIs um, expe would especially play an important role in this particular exercise. Next slide, please. Um, the coordinating team for the BPF is as shown. Uh, this is our, our page as well as our mailing list. If you're interested in, con in supporting or participating, you are welcome. Last slide. Yeah, and this just provides, uh, sorry, <laughs> provides a background of the work that has led to what we are currently doing in 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any comment, comments or questions from this team? Okay, then seeing none, we'll move to the next one, Policy Network on Meaningful Access. Are you gonna put us, I'm waiting for the slide. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Nima Lugangira, MAG member uh, for the Policy Network on Meaningful Access. We have two co-chairs, myself, who I'm here physically, and we have Giacomo, who's online. So, next slide. So here we just try to show a snapshot of the 2022 achievements under the Policy Network on Meaningful Access, because we believe that it's important to have that continuation. So we've identified practices and challenges, and the key focus areas here are connectivity, digital inclusion, and capacity development. And we're also putting um, special attention on the issue of access and content, especially diversity of languages, services, and digital material. So if you can see under the three main pillars, we have a collation of good practices, practices and policy solutions, 
as benchmarks for implementation and scaling. And here we have the regional contributors from the different places that are, have been listed. And then we have collaboration within and outside the Internet Governance Forum community. And we have international organizations as, as listed, as well as a list of recommendations and key issues around meaningful access. And here we, we're trying to put um, particular emphasis on community work to identify pressing issues and potential collaborations to solve them. So these were the main 2022 um, achievements. Now, as far as 2023 process is concerned, we want to unfold the collaborations into actions. And this is where we're focusing on multi-stakeholder public debate to influence policy change. And this takes into account the upcoming Global Digital Compact leading to the summit uh, for the future 2024, as well as active contributions to the roadmap that is WISIS uh, plus 20 and IGF plus 20. We're, we're maintaining the same focus areas, connectivity, digital inclusion, capacity building, and we've outlined um, the expected outputs and the priority goals. We're also aligning our priority goals following to 2022 um, considerations. And we have the primary and, and uh, priority collaboration that is you know, guidance and assistance from the IGF Secretariat and the leadership panel, which is going to link into, the, into having a permanent dialogue between the PNMA community and institutional part partners like the EU, um, AU, and the OAS. And I think very quickly I can invite Giacomo, who's online, um, to talk about uh, the, our final slide. Thank you very much, uh, Nima. Um, so we're not to be with you, but then with Sardinia in holidays, uh, unfortunately the dates are clashing. So just to close the, the slide presentation, these are the priorities that we have proposed to the group in the first meeting we had uh, two weeks ago. Now there will be another meeting at the end of the month and uh, between now and then we are collecting all the input from the members of the policy network. Um, as you can see, we'll, the focus will be on uh, implementation of the lessons and policy regulatory conditions that uh, can support uh, the best practice that we have um, identified. Uh, once that we have identified the best practices of last year plus the new of this year, we want to uh, actively promote these best, uh, best practices in order to make available to everybody across the world. In this sense, we need the help of the leadership panel uh, and of the secretariat, of course, because we need to bring this proposal to the, to the institutions that will be um, so we need a common dialogue to be established between the PNMA community and the institutional partners that can improve in practice what we have identified as best solutions. One of the idea is to start from Africa because this is one of the places where access is more urgent to be improved in order to create awareness, uh, meaningful access among the policymakers and support you know, the practice and the diversity of language and contents as indicated in the report from Addis Ababa last year. I want to also make this achievement identified through the to be called the process. We hope that will be taken in account by the uh, We're just having a little bit of problems and hearing And we you. also want to keep... Oh, sorry. Well, can you... Is any better? Uh, yes. Um, is any better? I'm not too sure what the problem is. I mean, the connection is there, but it's just... Uh, there's something, but uh, but please carry, carry on, carry on. Uh. If if it's bad, uh, Nima can comp or Daphne can complete because the, the, the slide is there. So tell me without problem. I'll try to finish. Uh, yeah, please fi uh, try and finish so, uh, and just speak slower. Yeah. Okay. So we want to bring all this uh, to the attention of Digital Compact Initiative. This is what the last thing I said. Uh, we send a written contribution that we hope will be taken in consideration. We also maintain the repository of the practice that has been over time. 
in order to create the references for all activities that will be developed in the field of meaningful access. We want to amplify the voices of least <coughs> advantaged groups in the public debate about meaningful access. And mainly last year in the session we had that Addis Ababa was identified that women can play a very important role in this. And finally, we want also to monitor the implementation of processes that has been identified in the various areas, in the various region, in order to see how much of this experience can be exported and replicated somewhere else. Thank you. I hand over to you. Probably in the room can interact with you. Sorry for the inconvenience. Um, thank you very much uh, for listening. So that's that's our presentation for the policy network on meaningful access. Thank you very much. Any initial comments or concerns from assembled? If I may, I see that there is the hand of Wood. Wood. Yes, I hope you can hear me. And greetings from the Netherlands. Um, this is on the cybersecurity one. I have the hand up for that long. Um, that I have one question to the organizers. What I missed in the overview is we see all the questions and the and the and the cases that they are trying to uh, investigate in the coming two months. But what is the goal? What will be the messages coming out of them? And looking at the presentation of Giacomo and his colleagues, there's a very, very clear road towards where they want to move. And I've missed that in the cybersecurity one. So the question is, what will be the goal? What will be the messages that you're going to share on the basis of your, of your re, uh, research? Thank you. Thank you. Good time. You'd like to respond? Yeah. Sorry, Chair, it's a uh, one here. I don't know if I can answer this because I. Yes, yes, Wim. You, I think we, Wim can uh, respond as he's a uh, consultant and part of the organizers team. Okay, we'll go for it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, because I, I didn't hear. Uh, I actually had that my put on my hand earlier um, because I don't know if it's possible to return to the presentation and the third last slide because due to a uh, Missynchronization. Um, that slide was actually only shown for for a few seconds. And I think that, on the one hand, that has the key one of the key messages for the uh, for the presentation today, and partially, I think, will answer what's uh, what's questions. You no, know, the one uh, slide before, uh, one before that. Okay. Uh, so, I think part of the the immediate question for for about is uh, what does the BT, BPF wants to uh, wants to bring as as output message? Um, well, we actually don't know because we are still assembling and we still need to work with the groups of volunteers over the uh, next two months uh, to uh, really uh, try and find out the message. So the overall idea that's behind. Uh, the best practice form is uh, that on the one hand, you have um, people that are uh, really invested uh, in, in doing research, people that are uh, discussing in uh, the diplomatic circles on, on cybersecurity, and that very often they only uh, or they have a very deep uh, practical and theoretical knowledge. But then that whole story, what is missing is the experiences of the people 
uh, in a specific country that actually have the influence or the impact of a specific uh, cyber attack or the people that uh, in the first hours um, are, are there to, to either uh, inform, send out warnings or do the first, take the first actions. So in terms of output, that actually is what the BPF this year uh, wants to do, try to connect those two so that the people that uh, actually the people um, that uh, discuss policy, that discuss norm settings for the future uh, can connect, have uh, a little bit or have uh, that extra knowledge um, they can use uh, or they can refer to in their in their work. Uh, so, 1, uh, I hope that that partly answered the, the question. Uh, the reason why I really wanted to ask you to show this uh, slide again, I mean, it was mentioned by the co facilitators in the, the presentation, but. Uh, like I said, it wasn't on the screen is that we really. Uh, for this work, we really count on, on volunteers and really count on input uh, from the people in the in the countries at different places, not. Uh, necessary people that are already involved in uh, IGF, already involved in the discussions. Uh, because if we want to have uh, with the BPF those uh, stories of victims, first responders, um, there might have been, there might be stories that have been in the, the early hours uh, be taking up in, um, in local newspapers, in local blog posts. Uh, also, information that is not necessarily uh, available in, um, in in later English uh, English speaking reports or English uh, later reports in English. So uh, that is something really important, and I think the uh, the co facilitators also um, will, will fully agree that we we count on the the colleagues uh, we count on the the mic also to help spread this uh, this information and try to get those people uh, on board, and uh, we. Uh, also think that it is important to reach out to NRIs with the idea that if there was a, a specific cybersecurity or one of the cybersecurity incidents with an impact in the region, region, there is a good chance that there has been an NRI session, uh, a local IGF that organized a session uh, on that uh, security event or some security incident. And I think this is information uh, that is, is crucial and can directly be linked in the uh, uh, or fed in the work of the IGF uh, or the BBF. Sorry. So I hope that I did those two things now. Answer to Walt's question on one hand, and uh, well, I think while talking uh, took taking enough time so that the slide was uh, visible long enough so that uh, other my members and people uh, joining in can uh, can help us doing this work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we will have the network on uh, policy network on internal internet fragmentation. I think it's Wim who's got this one. Yes, i just checking if Bruna is probably not. She says she also had a conflict and would uh, not be back on time. So, unless she's in the uh, room, I will uh, give the presentation and. The, our other co-facilitator, Shital Kumar, is, uh, I would say unfortunately, but it's not so unfortunate for, uh, for her. She's on, uh, on leave this week, so she also couldn't uh, present. So. Um, so the next slide, please, the policy network on internet fragmentation. I will keep it very short because um, I don't want to be too repetitive of the presentation you already heard uh, during the intersessional event. So the original mandate was is um, working on uh, or discussing raising awareness on the technical policy, legal and regulatory measures and actions that pose a risk to the open, interconnected and interoperable internet. Last year, uh, the PNF started to work. Initially, um, the, the idea was we need to focus on coming up with a definition of what internet fragmentation is because that's the first step when you uh, want to come to uh, uh, best practices or want to come to, to guidance. But very quickly, we realized that the opinions are too diverse to do that. Uh, so we took a step back and started to build a framework for discussing fragmentation. 
with the aim to come up with something that allows a more holistic discussion and an inclusive debate with uh, different divisions uh, being on the table and, and stepping a bit away from often uh, you have those fragmentation discussions where 90% of the time is uh, a yes no discussion where half of the room says this is fragmentation, the other half of the room says no, this should not be considered fragmentation. We hope um, to have um, stepped away from that a little bit by uh, developing that, uh, that framework. And in the meantime, uh, created a space for a more focused discussion and uh, a space that allows to work towards uh, solutions and uh, policy approaches. Uh, next slide. The next slide. Uh, the framework was discussed on uh, on Monday, so I will not uh, dive uh, deeper into that. So in um, as Bruna on Monday explained, the DPM in 2023 wants to further refine uh, its framework by uh, working in three dimensions, unpacking what is fragmentation, what is not, prioritizing uh, not everything that is fragmentation uh, should be uh, avoided or necessarily is a risk that, that needs to be addressed. That's behind the question about prioritization. And the last point, addressing what uh, guidelines or principles could help to address or prevent fragmentation uh, to happen. And having that discussion for the three dimensions uh, we identified in the framework. The next slide. So, um, we, we in the uh, and I have learned from uh, the approach we took last last year, and that is that uh, when you have a discussion that is relatively open, uh, with uh, open in, in the sense everybody can join, but also open in the sense that you leave sufficient time um, to people uh, that are participating to to. Uh, discuss and have their vision, uh, uh, explain their vision. That can be uh, can provide a, a very rich amount of information and information that is not collected or more difficult to collect if you would have the same questions in a survey, for example. Uh, that's why the PNF so far organized three 90-minute webinars, uh, where we had a couple, three, four um, experts invited were uh, not asked to give a presentation, but just a short introduction, like four minutes, five minutes, after which there was a the discussion with everyone involved in the, in the, in the room. Uh, so we had uh, one webinar so far for each of the dimensions, internet governance and coordination, internet user experience, and internet technical layer. Also, um, in the first months of the PNF, we did some outreach activities, including um, a presentation. We were invited uh, by the IIB, the Internet Architecture Board, to uh, give an update on the PNF uh, during one of their uh, their meetings. Uh, we had, uh, or we were present, or were part of a discussion of the Brazil IGF. Uh, we also organized or co-organized together with the UK governance. And thank you to Ross, who I think is in the room for, uh, for help and is doing a lot of the work there. A PNF session on frag or fragmentation se session during Wirescom. And last of the least, it was also mentioned that the PNF um, provided or uh, submitted an, um, or submitted a document to or a comment to the GDC uh, consultation. In big lines, what was in that uh, uh, paper or in that answer to the GDC consultation was mainly that uh, reflecting that there are a lot of visions um, around internet fragmentation, but that it is important that uh, there is an open uh, discussion with different stakeholders for that. Next slide. So, all the work, a lot of work is still coming up in the next uh, months. So, we are in the um, process of forming three working groups now. 
to further work on what came out on what was discussed during the webinar. Uh, part of it's helping to document what was said um, to have a more refined framework or more refined understanding of the, those different uh, dimensions in the debate on fragmentation. Those three working groups will also be crucial uh, to identify best current practices, guidance, uh, to address or, or avoid fragmentation, including uh, any possible or relevant messages that could be used uh, or could be sent to the GDC, but also uh, broader um, outside to other, uh, other discussion forums. Um, the, I mean, we have a, a number of uh, already a good number of volunteers per uh, working group that came out, out of the webinars, but the call or the, uh, there's still a possibility uh, for volunteers to join that work. So, important, an important step now is before the IGF itself uh, in, um, in October that we plan at least one uh, joint call of those three groups again uh, to discuss and uh, compare what they came up with and see if there, if there is a possibility for overarching principles with regard to fragmentation, if there are common practices, or if on the contrary, something that uh, is possible, uh, there are incompatibilities between the groups. And that uh, if you talk about uh, fragmentation with regard to user experience and fragmentation with regard to a technical layer, that you come up that you come up with principles that do not 100% or do not fit together. Uh, and that's, uh, Jumping back, one of the, the comments with when developing the framework was also that we have to uh, look at the different interlinkages between the dimensions. So that's one of the points. So after that, or that workshop uh, will actually be one of the or, or be the blueprint for what the PNF wants to bring to the IGF meeting in IGF uh, in uh, in Kyoto. Uh, having the same discussion, saying we discussed, we had the webinars, we did, we uh, had some additional work in working groups, and come with these observation or discussions or draft uh, guidance, and then use the IGF 2023 to have that discussion with the broader community. That's what we're uh, or the PNF really is looking forward to. Uh, the next slide is. Um, just an overview of the links. We uh, so we are with a small coordinating team with Bruna and Sheetal, I already mentioned, uh, but back then, and, and receiving a lot of uh, input and, and uh, ideas from the multi stakeholder working group of, uh, of experts. And uh, the two other links uh, are the PNF web page and the link to the mailing list. So that was the update, and if there are any questions or comments, happy to answer. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments for this group? If not, then I think we have the last one. Um, and we have Marcus on artificial intelligence and uh, Adas. And we have Wyman. Um, his hand is up. Online. Oh, well, I'm in. Please take the, the mic. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Mike Shai. Um, yeah, maybe I should turn off my camera. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, I, I just like to, like to have a comment and a consideration for the policy network on fragmentation. Um, the one, one, one context is that the GDC, there's a policy brief issued by the Secretary General, and the subject of uh, fragmentation has also been addressed, um, including like there is, a, there is a line to say that there must be a collective effort to ensure that regional, national, or industry initiative, <clears throat> however well-meaning, do not further fragment the internet. And some of you must have seen uh, their discussion around that, including, including a, a blog by our former Mac member Benny Iken, uh, that actually say that there is uh, there's no 
background <clears throat> or evidence in the policy brief to talk about how the internet today is 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 fragmented or not fragmented. Um, so I just want to want to highlight the important work of especially about this policy. Uh, this uh, this uh, this policy network. Um, and I wonder if the policy network on internet fragmentation can consider issuing a policy brief uh, either before or after the Kyoto IGF um, that actually put into the work of both last year and this year. Um, that about the multi-stakeholder discussion gathered here through the internet uh, governance forum um, on the approach, the like the question, I think that's been quite widely accept, accepted. There's both a technical layer and an experience layer. And of course, more and more will be involved. But I think this is one one opportunity for for IGF to to actually have uh, have uh, advanced and also uh, well informed, guided through a bottom up um, um, approach through different stakeholders through the policy network uh, about this emerging subject of uh, internet fragmentation. Thank you, Chen. Thank you. Is there anyone who'd like to respond to Oyman's request? If I may give it a... Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> if I may uh, give a quick reaction. Uh, I would say thank you very much for the, uh, for the support, uh, Oyman and... Uh, uh, for the input, I, I think when it comes to um, to, to policy brief, I, I, one of the questions that came up and it, it might be linked is in terms of the uh, the output and the format of the uh, of the report, uh, because I remember during one of the discussions um, the group had, uh, it was also suggested that we. Um, or the policy network should aim to something that is easy and clear. Uh, and, and not too long and easy read, readable um, for people involved in, in other discussions. And I think that uh, could be linked to the idea of uh, uh, making sure that the output um, gets the form of a kind of, uh, of policy brief that reflects both this year, last year's works and uh, very strongly underlines the uh, very strongly along the lines that if you organize discussion with uh, multi stakeholders or different stakeholders around the table, that you probably end up with having complete other uh, or a different uh, concept of non fragmentation than when you have an expert discussion on the uh, uh, or discussion with experts uh, around the table. And then a brief, uh, if I may, brief reaction to Mark in the chat. Uh, a little more of the prospective inputs to the GDC and the next steps on avoiding fragmentation. I would just very briefly say this, give the same answer as I gave to uh, uh, to Wout with regard to the, the policy network, um, with regard to the uh, BPF. Uh, that is actually what DPNF wants to discuss in the next weeks. If there are uh, inputs to be given to the GDC if there are uh, clear steps that can be taken on uh, avoiding fragmentation. Uh, so instead, uh, so I, I would say it, it is really crucial um, to join those groups or to follow that discussion and to um, to take part in, in that work because that in, in that and in the coming weeks and even in the discussion at the uh, at the IGF. Uh, that will be the out output of that uh, of those discussions. Really common to a uh, uh, an understanding if there is something as clear output that can come out of these uh, this uh, that is supported by uh, let's say the broader IGF discussion. So I hope that I have answered those two points. Thank you very much. Did anyone else want to respond? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, this is Alisa here for the record. Um, I also just wanted to um, request the, the, the policy network that once the workshops have been announced, 
um, you'd look at which workshops are on internet fragmentation and maybe um, reach out to them if possible at least um, and to see if any of your input or if there's any possibility in further collaboration with with these workshops or with the the people organizing these workshops because i think um, that should be the the strength of the igf in in ensuring that these connections are there and i think i i saw something on a call for volunteers so maybe um in the in the organizers of the different workshops you might even find some uh, some people who would be be interested in uh, in joining the network if i may just a brief thank you that's a great suggestion okay and um, i think marcus you're up and there's Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, others here. I'm Mac Member, co-facilitator of the Policy Network on Artificial Intelligence. Um, maybe as I wait for the slides to go up, I can just um, give a brief background on the Policy Network. Um, so the Policy Network um, was proposed during the discussions held uh, last year um, at the UNIGF 2022 main session on addressing advanced technologies, including artificial intelligence. Um, the draft TADIS messages concluded that the IGF could be used as a platform for developing cooperation mechanisms on artificial intelligence, and that a policy network on artificial intelligence could be considered for the upcoming work streams in order to review the implementation of different principles with appropriate tools and metrics. Um, with that background, uh, I can move into the goals of the policy network. Um, so there are five main goals. The first one is to focus on AI and related aspects of data governance uh, by learning from and elevating uh, AI governance frameworks, uh, principles, policies uh, being developed in and for the majority world and non-Latinx languages. Um, the third uh, goal is to set up focus conversations uh, and develop clear messages. Um, and the fourth is to bring the IGF's multi-stakeholder community together and build on previous discussions, as well as to create synergies and input from the global AI policy dialogue. Um, so for the past, um, I think, two months now, uh, since May, um, there's been a lot of work done. Um, maybe if we can move to the next slide. Um, the first one being um, drafting a work plan uh, for the policy network from the inception until um, IGF 2023. Um, this has already been put in place. Um, there was also a brainstorming exercise uh, to um, focus uh, the work of the policy network and um, to look into what could be the sub-themes for the policy network. Um, there was three sub-themes identified um, and I will dive deep into this uh, in the next slides. Um, the PNAI report outline uh, with the scene setter, as well as the three um, uh, sub themes, as well as the three drafting teams, as well, that started their work. Um, there has been three PNAI meetings held, um, uh, and there's collaboration between the meetings and the broader stakeholder engagement. Uh, we have uh, up to 193. Uh, mailing list recipients and uh, a very high engagement during the meetings. Um, just to um, go through uh, what the report is and what the preparations are, um, so we started with the open dialogue um, that defined the thematic focus, um, which are the three areas that I'll talk about later, um, and there was gathering of information. Now the PNAI is moving into drafting. Uh, where the three drafting teams have started um, their work and later into consultation and finalizing the report uh, leading to IGF 2023 in Kyoto. Um, so talking about the three sub-themes um, of which the larger community group of experts um, and, multi and, and this, all the stakeholders on the PNAI um, uh, chose to work on is the first one is the global interoperability of AI governance um, the second is AI and gender slash race, uh, and the third one is uh, environment and AI. Uh, all these will pull into uh, the report, and 
uh, the overall pen holders will um, ensure that uh, the report follows a flow um, uh, throughout. Um, so just to go into timelines, maybe uh, next slide. Um, so as I mentioned uh, with May, we started with the open dialogue um, of which um, the three uh, thematic areas or thematic focus were identified that I just mentioned above. Um, there was gathering of information uh, and now we're moving uh, into the drafting, um, the drafting teams. Uh, we have had the three uh, PNA calls, as I mentioned, and we have a fourth one coming through, and we intend to have eight um, until the, the, the IGF 2023. Um, so that was a brief on the, on the progress so far. If there are any questions, be happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you. Comments or questions? No comments or questions. So now we have Marcus. Oh, for the dynamic coalitions. Thank you, Chairman, for giving me the floor. It's Marcus Gomez speaking in my capacity as co-facilitator of the Dynamic Coalition's Coordination Group. I have informed the MAG in previous, uh, a few days ago that the Dynamic Coalitions have adopted a common charter uh, that is posted now on the uh, screen. And we think it's a big step forward for the Dynamic Coalitions, the Coordination Group, is meeting regularly and has over the years uh, developed some common base lines. Uh, it started with three core principles, namely that they need to have open mailing lists, open membership and open archives as a very basic uh, rule. But the charter lists also uh, what is needed to uh, be uh, accepted as a dynamic coalition and that they need to have documents in place. And can you scroll down at the list? Yeah. Well, if we don't want to go through all details of the charter, but it clearly puts also obligations on the dynamic coalitions we already had that previous. I mean, it's not totally new. It's a result of a long process. We had two or three years ago had a big consultation and produced a paper that summarized all the uh, suggestions that came up and had also issues to be explored. And this is now all put together in this charter. And in our view, it's a big step forward towards a more cohesive uh, activity of all the dynamic coalitions. The dynamic coalitions are very diverse. Uh, there's no one size fits all model for all of them. And, uh, but it's important to have some very common uh, guidelines and principles that they abide by. And also the dynamic coalitions see that themselves as an easy point of entry into the IGF universe for newcomers. They can find somebody that might fit their interests. Right now we have 26 uh, dynamic coalition covering a wide range of a variety, a wide range of issues. Uh, with that, obviously, should there be any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer. Maybe my co-facilitator, Yuta, may wish to add a few words. Of course, I can do so if I'm invited to, to do so. Yes, I do think that the charter and also what we presented uh, on our intersessional work on Monday uh, clearly shows the dynamic character of the uh, work of dynamic coalitions. And I do think that is a very important uh, point when, when looking at dynamic coalitions work that they because they are bottom up, they are most of them, I would say all of them, are able to react to these fast evolving innovations that we are facing in, in the digital environment. Uh, and that is 
with regard to the opportunities that have been mentioned uh, this morning by uh, Adam, which I really appreciated, but of course also with regard to the threats coming from the digital environment. And therefore, this is reflected in, in the charter, and I do think that is what the dynamic solutions can bring forward to internet governance. And that means also to the annual meeting and in between. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, one uh, additional element that deserves highlighting is that we do require to pro the dynamic collisions to produce an annual report, but that's more a factual report that states their activities. But in addition, we ask them that they should organize at least one annual meeting or produce at least one output. And output is defined as a document on the focus issue other than the annual report an event or project dedicated to the issue. So it is an attempt to make sure that dynamic collisions remain output oriented. Uh, if there are no questions, I would like then to move to the other issue I've also shared with the MAG, a concept note on the main session proposal, and that is also there on the screen. We. Uh, discussed various possible headings, but it's always very difficult for such a wide range, uh, such a wide uh, range of uh, activities to focus on one issue, and that's why we decided to rally behind this year's main theme, the internet we want, and empowering all people. And we have, if you can scroll down, Celine, on, the, you see we have, try also to move away, and we discussed that earlier, that branding is an important issue, and a, a DC main session is of no interest to the average internet user. So we try to find a title that would maybe be more trendier. We have not yet agreed on a title, but these are three suggested titles. Whether or not uh, they are good, I can Need, may need further discussion, but we want to convey the issue that this is not an inward-looking session where dynamic coalitions discuss how they organize themselves, but it is a forward-looking session. What uh, contribution dynamic coalitions can make to the internet we want, and as Jutta also highlighted, by their bottom-up nature can really empower people. So. We try to combine that. It's playing maybe with the words, but uh, maybe MAG members may have better ideas, but that's still work in progress. And a last thought, uh, we have not discussed that uh, as a dynamic coalition coordination group, but building on the session we had on the first day, the intersessional event, another approach could be for the MAG to g give a title, give a heading, and ask dynamic coalitions what they can contribute to a theme at the, at the IGF. And as the dynamic coalitions and the charter also makes it clear, we clearly are committed to working with the other uh, parts of the intersessional community, the other components, BPFs, NRIs, and policy networks. That could also be an option that we kind of repeat in a maybe better organized way, the experiment we had uh, on Monday where we tried to produce an intersessional input into the main themes. Uh, so this is, with this, I have finished my presentation. Again, uh, Jutta may wish to add a few thoughts, and if not, uh, I'm ready to answer questions colleagues may have. Thank you again for giving me the floor. I, I only have one thought, and I share that with my colleague, Thorsten, who had already to leave. And maybe you've become aware that he is a newcomer to Internet governance. But he said uh, in lunch break to me that he really appreciates that we have a main overarching theme this year, which is named The Internet We Want, 
it's not the internet we do not want. And I think that, that reflects very well what is in the work of all the dynamic coalitions, but should maybe also be the spirit of our deliberations here, that we concentrate on how can we achieve that the internet is built like we want it to be. And I see in the potential of the 26 uh, dynamic coalitions, but I also see the potential of all the people working towards such a program that is focused on the positive aspects of the internet we want. Thank you. Chris. Thanks, Paul. Chris Buckridge, Tech Community Mag member. Um, and thank you, Marcus, for the, the update. And uh, I'm, well, I'm perhaps understanding, but I wanted to sort of confirm my understanding. I, we do have 26 dynamic coalitions. They're covering a very wide and diverse range of topics and issues. So when we're talking about this session, are we primarily talking about an operational discussion of how can these different groups work together to contribute to? I'm seeing Yuta shaking her head. And I'm, I'm, I, I, I mean, I would be a little surprised if that was correct, but I'm also perhaps not gathering how a single 90-minute session draws on 26 very different kinds of, of groups and topics and issues um, to pull together a cohesive idea of how this moves us, that work moves us towards the internet we want, unless what you're talking about is a sort of operational, this is how all of these disparate groups can work together to produce something and then have an idea of what that, that something looks like. Um, so yeah, but perhaps I'm, I'm being stupid and missing what, what was there, but if that's the case, I'd appreciate it if it was explained again. Thanks. Chris, we all know you're not stupid. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's a relevant question. And in the past, we always struggled a bit with bringing so many diverse, wide range of issues together into one session. So we thought, as a starting point, we would ask each dynamic coalition that is interested in participating in the session to produce a short paper to say what their contribution would be. Not backward looking, but really forward looking, how they see themselves as making a contribution. And then based on the papers received, we would like as coordination group to try and cluster some themes and choose then maybe five or six speakers representing one each of these themes which we think are related to each other. Now, whether this will work remains to be seen. It will be a challenging exercise, as you said rightly. It's a wide range of variety of issues they group together, but uh, they each have a contribution to make. And we listened, uh, I think, on Monday. I mean, we have, again, I get back to the very one of the very uh, first dynamic coalition, the DCAD, on making a contribution to accessibility issues, uh, accessibility in the conference itself, but also accessibility on the internet, which is a very relevant issue, and so on and so on. But again, uh, help of the MAG, MAG would be greatly appreciated and also input, and we have also a, a MAG liaison, we would be happy to have your uh, input. Okay. Sorry, can I just a very brief follow-up? Um, when are you expecting to have these papers from the interested DCs? Because I assume it's, it's not until that point that you can really start to right. properly envisage the session. Well, we had tentatively thought uh, that we would need the papers uh, uh, pretty soon as there's not much time left, so and be moving into the summer break, so we would, and we have already scheduled a session for next week for the coordination group where we would then agree on the next steps on what are the relevant deadlines, but I think uh, we really would need to have uh, the first papers ready in the first half of August, I would have thought, so uh, roughly a month from now and then move from there and hopefully that we would have uh, the session together 
at the latest by mid-September. So that was the tentative uh, deadline. But obviously, we would also need, in order to move forward, the green light of the MAC to go ahead with that. Yeah. Thank you. If I may add one sentence. Uh, the, the session of the Dynamic Coalitions definitely should be driven by the themes and not by all the uh, aspects. Uh, nonetheless, we've, we've uh, heard this morning that there is some interrelationship between decisions taken by, by the MEC, but I, I think what Marcus suggested before uh, could be beneficial also for the Dynamic Coalitions. If the MAC decides on, on the further main sessions, that could also give orientation to the, to the Dynamic Coalitions when we have our meeting next week and we will decide on what Dynamic Coalitions would like to uh, address jointly in the main session. That, that should not be a reduplication, uh, but should be uh, complementary, I do think is the correct word. Thank you. This is uh, Alice Heaver for the record. Um, I don't really want to comment on this specific um, um, session, but more on dynamic correlations in general and and all the, the 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 slots that are allocated for dynamic coalitions. And um, I understand. I, well, I don't want to um, uh, change anything for this year, but. I think we should maybe consider um, um, limiting the amount of spots for um, for dynamic coalitions on the IGF uh, or at the IGF meeting um, and make it slightly more, um, one could say, competitive to have a session at the IGF because, um, um, well, now currently there are 26 um, uh, dynamic coalitions, which is, uh, I think, a continuously growing number, um, and um, it's taking more and more space of the IGF or at the IGF. And I think um, we should really consider if that's that's the way we would want to move towards. Obviously, a dynamic coalition could also apply for a workshop or another session, but. Um, having this automatic position, I think we should really, for next year, think about if that's something we want to to remain uh, to have, or if if we should uh, set a, a few further guidelines on this. Thank you. Thank you would. Yes. Thank you, Paul. And. I'll take my hand down immediately. Uh, what I wanted to suggest, and perhaps that helps Lisa's comment a little bit as well, is that we've been asking more or less what can the IGF do for us, but we could also turn that around. And see what can we do for the IGF? And I think that most dynamic coalitions, and that was the whole purpose of the event on Monday, have significant output for the IGF. And that it is about, again, the word, some sort of recognition of that output in the IGF program. If I reflect from my own dynamic coalition on Lisa's contact, I could probably organize 10 sessions which would all have significant content. But let's leave it there for a moment on that discussion, which will happen next year. What I would like to propose is the following. There will be many sessions at this IGF where questions come up, whether it's on digital health, whether it's on cybersecurity, whether it's on internet fragmentation, whether it's on etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What if we feed these questions into the dynamic coalitions and ask them to come up with an answer? As some may say, no, that's not what we're in the game for. We do our own work, but others would perhaps welcome it and become more relevant because of it. So I think that that is a way where the IGF will most likely profit very much from the intersectional work 
and come up with answers that the world has and has proposed to the IGF to come up with an answer. So if we do that, it will become true synergy and truly output driven. And I think that if we are able to get our head around that, how to organize it, we will make the IGF more relevant than it is now and probably make it one of the most relevant organizations in the world where we are not negotiating. But let, let me stop there and uh, thank you for having the opportunity. Thank you. It strikes me that uh, feeding questions into an entity is an interesting way to go, including taking all those questions and putting them through an AI. Okay, we've we have pretty much done to the end of our agenda, but Chris is got a flag up. Sorry, thanks, Paul. I, I just I kind of wanted to weigh in one last time, less with a question, more some thoughts and observations. Um, I, I think this session sounds to me very ambitious even if we don't have the time constraint, and we have the time constraint. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's not, I mean, obviously I'm not in a position to say we shouldn't do this, and I, I don't think, I, I do think that the DCs are a very important part of the IGF and that giving visibility to that is an important aspect of showcasing the IGF as strong and relevant and timely and, and legitimate, et cetera. Um, yeah. Th uh, as I say, I think pulling together the point of the DCs is that they are so disparate, so diverse, so focused on very specific issues that it seems to me an attempt to do this that pulls together, you know, input from the DCs on an as yet to be determined theme or, or issue seems ambitious. I'll, I'll stick with that word. Um, but yeah, I'll be following, I think, closely. I'm very curious to see all of the papers that come in from, from the DCs. Um, and to see how a sort of common theme for a cohesive 90-minute session is pulled together from that. Um, I mean, I do think, uh, uh, sort of responding to Alyssa's thoughts there, I think as we go into the next cycle, of, well, I mean, we already know town halls. <laughs> um, th there needs to be a bit of an overhaul, generally, of, of the sessions and how we, how we allocate them, how we assign them. I, I've said this, I think, to a number of people informally, and I'm happy to say it sort of formally. I think the best approach for the dynamic coalitions would be to be simply proposing workshop sessions and to be in amongst those workshop sessions and that being a DC, particularly being an active DC with sort of runs on the board, demonstrated outputs, would stand them in very good stead to receive one of those workshop proposals. So I wouldn't imagine that a very active DC producing outputs would be not accepted. Um, but yeah, we need to sort of bring back to a situation where most of the sessions that we ha have are going into the same competitive pool so that we have the most competitive and compelling event that we, we can. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Dino. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to make a comment vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, proposal of the best practice group on cybersecurity uh, because I communicated to Josephine directly that uh, I was uh, very interested in volunteering. And I also follow the, the chat. There were some exchanges vis-a-vis -vis that group that talks about mapping of standards. And I'm getting a little bit confused. And now, especially with this discussion about DCs versus the real work of the IGF, I think that maybe there is an opportunity for synergies here. So the first comment that I have is when I read the goals and objectives of the best practice on the cybersecurity, there is a, an aim to identify the impact that certain cybersecurity incident had, but also to evaluating that impact. And there was a stress that Wim made emphasis on the fact that uh, the volunteers should be really focused on those that were directly affected. 
So, for example, from my best practice, uh, from my point of view, the, the type of contribution that I can give, and that, that's why I, I went and I got in touch with Josephine, is that for several years I was in charge of the IT audit in the United Nations, and I did many of these assessments. And so my contribution would be from a methodological point of view. If, if you want to evaluate something, before you reach the impact, there are several steps before. In, in the world of assessment of audit, there are the five Cs, the criteria, the condition, the cause, the consequence, and the corrective action. So when we're talking about impact, we're talking about the consequence. So the first question that the subject matter expert will ask is, what are the criteria that you use to evaluate the impact? So I will offer my experience in methodology. So my first question to Wim is, are you only looking for those directly affected by the incident, or are you also looking for someone that can bring the methodological aspect? So this, now, logically speaking, brought me to the uh, comment that Chris was making. It seems that we are looking at the various components of the IGF, dynamic collision, best practice network, work, uh, workshop session, as a separate events, as a completely separate uh, um, instances. But why not thinking about the opportunity that, for example, a DC on security could have a role in uh, best practice research work on cybersecurity. Because as Chris alluded to, DCs are very focused on specific matters that could in turn be useful and be leveraged by the best practice network. I'm specifically invested in blockchain maturity and assurance, so there could be a area of research by a best practice network that will affect that. I see that there are, as it was alluded to, 26 dynamic collision. So maybe there is an opportunity here, rather than see dynamic collision as an isolated subgroup of the IGF, but try to find in the intersectional activities opportunity for synergy and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita, for the record. I think what we, uh, there are three things. Uh, dynamic coalitions is also part of IGF. They work in a different way. The, what the mandate of the best practice forum is decided by the community and not by the MAG. So whatever the community decides upon, that is what is worked upon. And I think when, since we are sitting in mid of Jan, July, it is very difficult to change tracks now since uh, first, you know, literally first week of October is the IGF. I think we need to make best use of the time we have in hand. Um, I understand Chris's concern that there are a wide range of DCs, but I'm sure the DC coalition can come up with a coherent kind of a program wherein they um, find something which synergizes with the overarching theme, et cetera. So perhaps, uh, Chris, what we could do is hear from them how they want to do. I am sure uh, there are DCs which have a lot of aspirations, which are generally good work, but may not fit into the entire picture. And I'm sure, uh, you know, the group as a whole can come up with something which works because we all know there is rationalizing of sessions, et cetera, coming. So let's leave it at them to come back with something which is good. I, I, you know, we do know Yuta, we do know Marcus, and I know they will come up, and Woot, of course, to come up with something. But I think sitting in July, trying to change track now is going to be bad. Uh, we need to make best use of what we can at this point of time. Thanks. Thank you. Other comments? Anyone online? I think Wim's hands up. Yes, uh, I guess, sorry, I had my... Okay. I had my hand up as a... Uh, well, I was directly addressed, but uh, the, the question should actually be addressed to uh, uh, all co-facilitators as well. And uh, uh, happy that you already talked to Josephine. Um, two things, of course, any kind of support with regard to the methodology for the best practice forum um, cybersecurity is more than uh, more than welcome. Uh, we would love, well, would, or we'll be looking forward to follow up on that. 
Uh, June, but one remark with that, when we discussed earlier on the planning, and it's linked to what Anrita also mentioned, the planning for this year is that we uh, work within that limited um, uh, constraint of, uh, we want to have something that involves uh, community members and something that is ready by the, uh, by the IGF itself. So, um, Probably, I mean, if you look at the same work from a scientific and very methodological uh, perspective, you will take other decisions. So um, that's I wanted to say. Very happy with with any support or, or suggestions, uh, which I will convey and discuss with the the other uh, co-facilitator with the co-facilitators. Uh, but please also think of the uh, um, the time and the time constraint that uh, BPF is working in. Thank you. Anyone else would like to make a comment? So we're coming up on the end of our agenda, which when we leave here means we basically have to figure out what the main sessions all are and cooperate with everybody to be able to put them on in, in just a couple of months. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just also wanted to um, remember ourselves that we would uh, ensure some time to prepare for the leadership panel meeting um, so we don't forget it. Right. Which is coming up here in just a little bit. I know. Um, so we're going to ask the Secretariat if there's any outstanding items or information that we need to know at this point. Um, now, um, not really. The agenda is attached here. Um, it's just a matter of um, having a unified idea of uh, points to bring up uh, when we're talking with the uh, leadership panel. No, that's just the schedule. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, we'll share it again for ease of reference. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. On the town, I mean, for the town hall, if you want to send to the secretariat your recommendations, uh, that is fine. Uh, please uh, go ahead, and then we will report back onto the mag list um, if we have any comments on that. But as I said, you know, um, uh, keep in mind that we can't really undo what we said beforehand, but yes, for the selection process, we can be stricter. That's, yes, Chengitai, yeah. but if you look at the mandate which was there, it has to be international in nature, etc. If those criteria are not met, I think there's a fair chance. As That's a, see, where have, I'm saying we, we don't can have be uh, from stricter. fifth to sixth. We've not got a main session, <laughs> and then you are letting everything go. That's not done. Huh? As in, no, in no, terms of I mean, eight sessions, we are we fought the entire day. No, we just could increase it, but to remember, we will have some town halls in the schedule. We're not going to have all of them, of course. We are going to be strictly looking at them. Um, Adam offered to give his views and preferences, please send them to the Secretariat. We'll look at them. Secretariat will share with the MAG the ones that have been selected. That's fine with me. I've got no issue with that. Um, just that there is going to be some town halls there. No, no, yeah. as in there may be town halls, there yeah. may be others, but please ensure that and they just, meet the criteria and, you yeah, know. Yeah, dot, 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 dot. And remember, as I said, that list is not the list of 
town halls that have been accepted. These are town halls under consideration. <laughs> yes, aspirational, as you've said. So uh, don't, and also please don't um, hold the view that if you lim eliminate so many town halls, it will free up space on the agenda as such. Um, Yes, yeah, so the intent the of... intent is to have a good IGF, not... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so the intent... We may have a personal interest in main session, but we can also forego it. But let's have something which makes sense, as in not... We rationalize community workshops, but we give everyone a chance with anything, sorry, as in... Uh, no, what I'm saying is that the, when we're doing this exercise, the thought is not okay, let's get rid of this so that we can have more workshop sessions or something like that. No, it is we need to make sure that town halls are really town halls and can uh, and do um, conform with the intended purpose. That's what I'm saying. So, um, which is because I was hearing several things here where there was a thought that you might be able to sacrifice some part to have more of the other. Yes, Chris. So, uh, well, two points. I'm sure it's not a one-to-one -one situation of eliminate five town halls, get five more works. Yeah. But this is dealing with a finite amount of space on a schedule, a finite number of rooms. There is an element of if we remove some of these town halls, there is more space for... Other, other yeah, but that should not be the intention. Be. That's what I'm no, saying. That's, I, that should not be the intention no, and as that's, such. That's true. But yeah. I mm -hmm. think the other important point, and I'm reading through the, the form here, I, I think town halls, like workshop proposals, it's great to put in a pro proposal. There is no obligation that anyone who submitted a town hall proposal and met you know, in, in the right format and with the right criteria will get a spot. Yeah. This is a competitive process. There mm -hmm. is a limited amount of space. So I, I, think we, I think the big concerns came from the sort of implication or the appearance that put in your workshop proposal, you go into a, com a com competitive process and only X number will get through. Put in a town hall or an um, a open forum proposal and as long as you've done it right and met the criteria, you will go through. And I think that's... Somewhat true for open forums because there are obviously institutional obligations and yeah. mm -hmm. politics at play. It's, it absolutely shouldn't be true for town halls, and I think that's definitely something to think about going into next year's cycle. But even for this year, there is not an obligation for us to accept every town hall that seems like it meets the criteria. If, but I never said are, that. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just making sure that we're all on the same page as to that, I'm that situation. I'm sure we are. <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> I like that confidence. Thank yeah. you, Chenkatai. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Right. Thanks. Um, we were supposed to also, there was a morning session that we were talking about our contribution to the WSIS Plus 20 um, that we did skip over. We did have a session in the open consultations and um, during that session, the majority of the interventions were from MAG members in any case. Um, so you do have the option, since we do have time, if you want to revisit that, that's another um, option. So there's two things here. If, you want, if we want to revisit our contribution to the WSIS Plus 20, um, we can. Let me just get the exact wording. Um, of the session. Um, yeah, MAG reflection on the exchange about IGF contributions to the GDC and WSIS plus 20. Um, so that's a session we skipped this morning. If we want to do that again, we can. If not, that is fine. I'll leave it up to um, you to decide. And also, um, I think it was Chris who did ask that we could go over what we're going to be doing tomorrow. That's more often uh, how the mag is going to be. I don't think that's 
from the Secretariat point of view. But yes, Chris. So, I mean, just, and uh, thank you, Celine, I think sent through the, mm -hmm. um, the agenda again. So this, this is the same agenda that was originally published, not the review, revised version that I sent through in which there was some discussion of, I don't think. Um, which is fine, it's not, it's not a major issue, but um, there are certainly some points that were made in that that maybe we, we do want to... Yeah, but remember, a... this is a draft agenda. No, so... and that's fine. That, that's, yeah, so mm. I, I think if, if we're regarding it as draft and flexible, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But, mm. um, okay. Adam? I suppose I have to begin with bingo because I walked in and you said town halls. But um, moving on from that, um, I agree with Chris, by the way. Um, yeah, this session, uh, you, you almost sort of segued into it yourself, I think, the GDC and WISIS plus 20, what are we going to do? This is something I think we should be discussing with the leadership panel. We saw the joint letter that went out. So I think it, the answer is yes, we want a session. What does it look like is something we should discuss with the leadership panel and, and you know, think of the direction on that. I think it's within their remit and I think it's within our sort of agenda to do that. So hold the session um, and let's see what we come up with tomorrow. Does that make well, um, sense? Tomorrow, if you look at this, uh, there's the IGF strategic outlook, IGF in the context of ongoing and coming processes, the GDC, um, the MAG, um, the LP MAG sounding board proposals. I mean, it fits right in there, uh, which is yeah. 20, et cetera. So that would be the place where we can discuss it with the LP. Yeah, yeah we're, we're sort of being able to say with the leadership panel, we've got, well, we have this session, guys. What are we going to do with it? And then the discussion we're having in that agenda is in some way trying to fill it out in a way, right? We're, we're making a a session from it. I think that's how we coordinate with them, and others who followed it more closely can jump in, Christopher. Runa. And then we have Justin. Thank you. Um, just about leadership panel, I, my suggestion would be for us to maybe have some dedicated discussion tomorrow on a joint plan of action for Summit of the Future, um, Global Digital Compact, how are we all working together? What are kind of the goals or what should be achieved by the end of next year? And this year as well, I do think the September meeting is a relevant opportunity. It might be good to use this moment to have some sort of a joint strategy on whether they can get us in or whether they can go to New York for the ministerial meeting, um, as well as which are the missions are we going to reach out um, jointly? Because even if the sounding board um, suggestion is not picked up upon, there's a lot of things we can still do with regards to like elevating the vision for the IGF and so on. So maybe tomorrow we can use this time to, to think about a joint strategy. That's all. Uh, thanks, Bruno. Justin. Um, yeah, just, uh, I'm just reacting to that and then I have something else. But uh, I, I do wonder if, you know, if, if the co-facilitators are coming and others are coming from New York and they're coming to talk about GDC, you know, one thing we could do is reach out to them and see what would be helpful um, from what would they like to hear, you know, at the IGF, what might be useful uh, in their work. And then we can help, you know, arrange our agenda, the session we're doing, uh, and perhaps be able to respond to that. That might be one thing the leadership panel can do is engagement, you yeah. know, with those or others. Um, but the before, fine going on on the agenda, I just wanted to not skip over the WISIS plus 20 discussion real quick. Um, we talked a little bit about that previously. Um, I think one thing just to uh, reinforce is it, it now looks like the MAG has, will, will designate a main session that talks on digital governance issues broadly, which we'll get into this. And the UN is organizing this high-level event on, um, or high-level discussion yes. on WISIS Plus 20. I think it would be very useful if there is information shared beforehand about what is that entails, so we can ensure that there is a, uh, a you know a synergy between this. Here's what the UN saying. Here's what stakeholders are talking about. But there's not a we'll come and just get briefed in, and then you know uh, folks are responding to that. IGF is a is a great place to share information, but we don't have to hold the information into the IGF. And sometimes it's better to share it early 
and then come to the IGF to discuss it than for it to be a place for announcements or a place to kind of uh, share the information initially. So just feedback for the Secretariat and through you, I think, to the other UN agencies that are working on this. Any information, if it's available beforehand, I think would be very useful, uh, including as the MAG prepares a session on digital governance, which will touch on some of the same uh, issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. Yes, uh, we will sh be sharing those concept notes. So just two things. I think a Adam, uh, when Adam came in and was answering, we, I wasn't really talking about the session at the um, IGF in Kyoto. I was just talking about our general response to WSS Plus 20 and the GDC. That session as well is another thing, uh, but that's for the IGF in um, Kyoto. And yes, as Justin has said, since the um, facilitators are coming to Kyoto as well, we would have to um, coordinate with all the possible and see what's the best way to do it um, for that session. And um, the comments on the, on the UN session um, has been noted and will be shared with them. And I'm quite um, confident that um, it will be looked at and seen how it can be um, reconfigured to be more of a um, interesting session that is not just um, telling people what they're doing. It's not a beauty show. It's, you know, it's more useful for the participants. Um, it has been noted, and we will be discussing that with um, New York. Thanks. Christine. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll just reiterate uh, what we discussed uh, during the strategy uh, working group. Um, I'm, I'm, I think that the timing, uh, the timeline is not serving us very well, given that the, um, uh, the ministerial is in September and the IGF is uh, after that. Uh, uh, so um, I think it will be important, like Bruno was saying, that tomorrow we, uh, we discuss what do we think from should happen uh, in September vis-a-vis -vis the IGF, especially that we'll be sitting in Kyoto discussing GDC and discussing also the future of, uh, I, if I may call it the IGF, uh, just broadly speaking. So, um, so, so in order to have a meaningful session actually in Kyoto, it's very important to, to, ha to plan uh, what is going to be said uh, from um, whoever is, is support of the IGF in September or isn't, I mean, uh, but, but I, we, we really need to think about that. And I think it's very due to think about it tomorrow because if anyone should be interested about the future of the IGF, it should be uh, the MAG and the leadership panel in, in my point of view. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Christine. And yes, um, I think that can be included in the uh, discussion. Um, I have Felix Chen um, online. I'll just, I know Matea may not agree with me, but we'll just, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Secretariat, uh, for the opportunity. Um, I was unable to attend the morning sessions um, and uh, was wondering where we were in terms of the main session topics and the facilitators. Thank you. Um, the question is, where are we in terms of uh, main sessions and the facilitators? So where we left off. <laughs> Where we, where we left off, if I'm recalling this correctly. Thank you. Um, where we left off the discussion on 
AI and gender or any one of a number of other handful of things was that we would form essentially a, an independent working group composed of anyone in the MAG who wanted to self-select in for the purpose of addressing the specific question because we've already addressed the question, will there be an AI session? The answer was yes. Everybody seems to be, or most everybody seems to be interested in being a participant in what that yes trans translates into. So we we'll put, put together essentially an independent effort to identify, taking into account all of the discussion that we've had today and yesterday and bringing to the MAG its recommendation for how we fill that gap. So no decision on anything specifically tonight, but to have some secretariat support. And those of you who want to participate specifically in selecting and discussing what that particular session is, are invited to do so. Um, does anybody wish to correct my remembering? Thank you, Paul. Not correcting your remembering. Uh, what I was suggesting is perhaps one good thing would be that uh, what we agreed is we have those groups open and something which uh, Adam had mentioned is uh, we don't restrict only those people who are so-called leading to comment on those topics or uh, themes, but we keep it in the main document so that, and we may have hyperlinks to those documents, but, and we also open it up to past MAG members or observers because last year also they helped in uh, framing the sessions and why not even DCs who are involved in those things or the BPFs or PNEI or, you know, P, the fragmentation or um, cybersecurity or access, et cetera, to participate. As in, let's not make it exclusive to whoever puts their name, but whoever wants to contribute. Uh, the more the merrier. Obviously, it's not that everyone will do everything, but... There could be some pen holders, but let's not restrict it just to few people. Okay, Justin and Chris. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, just on AI, I, and this goes back to kind of the branding or the uh, making sure that IGF is relevant. So the main session, I think, is an important conversation and can support that approach. I think we should also look at what was agreed within the, the, wor the workshops. And you know, to some of the conversations about we need to discuss different aspects of AIs, it's a it's a really good list that covers a lot of ethics, governance, gender, child protections, protections online. What's the future hold? I mean, it's a really good list, and I think we should think. You know, I, I don't know if it's an AI day, right? Because there's challenges logistically there, but I do think that the mag we should consider how we're framing these AIs discussion because they're touching a lot of different topics that are important across the board. We're just looking at it through the lens of artificial intelligence at a really important time for that conversation. And so the degree that, that the policy network, a main session, the, the opening ceremony and the workshops like all fit together, if we can talk about that in some way that is understandable, I think it will generate interest in the IGF, make a more you know, interesting conversation and, and relevant conversation. Uh, for folks looking for answers to these questions right now. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Um, thanks, Paul. And yeah, that, I'm agreeing with Justin. I uh, was actually taking the mic to agree with um, Rita in terms of yeah, just noting for the environment sustainability session, um, I'm keen to be part of the organizing team there. I see Peace has also put her name. Um, down there and certainly open to, to others. But I've put a link to a planning document um, just to keep going that discussion that's already started there and also start to think about um, the links, for instance, to the policy network on environment and the DC on environment that followed that, making sure that we are, those main sessions are linking back to that. Um, and then just other starting to get into other ideas for the kinds of speakers or kinds of 
issues that we'd want to um, start to develop there. So I think the sooner we can start to get on into that sort of practical planning phase for all of these main sessions, the better, because, um, yeah, we don't have a lot of time. Thanks. Thank you. So hopefully that was a clear enough answer for our telephone guest. Thank you. Really? always creates silencing for male voices in this room. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> no, just about um, AI, looking at you, Justin, because we were just on the session in the next door now and with like some new eyes, some new optics about AI regulation, maybe a global discussion on what could be a like a, this global agreement or what could mean um, this global agency for overseeing AI. I don't really know whether these things are in our map, but they could be um, if we're looking at a main session. Um, and it was, um, to me, it was a good example of a session that managed to kind of like balance the good and bad aspects about it. So, I mean, I'm almost convinced. <laughs> With regards to main, going back to main sessions, I'm putting myself to organize the one on digital governance. Um, I've already put myself on the, my name on the document. I assume this one should be like done together with workshops like working group strategy as well, just, just to mention some other areas or arenas and possibly um, draw upon some of the discussions from the PNIF as well on the fragmentation of process. So just putting my name forward for that. Thank you. Other questions or comments, concerns? Adam. I suppose the other thing that was left a little bit hanging in, in, um, in my opinion at least, is the number of sessions that would be available. I mean, what's going to be in the plenary is, uh, I don't think, was completely decided. I know Changatai was is quite wedded to five, but I think we're pushing back and saying why five. So um, there's, it looks to me like we could have a, a few more. I keep doing that. My ears are falling off. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so I, I wouldn't. Uh, you know, let's, let's still think about what plenary space we have available for different types of sessions. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, hello. Um, um, this is my first time at, at a MAG meeting. It's been very educational, I can say that. My name is Marcelo Martinez. I'm with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. Um, my question is simple, I think. Just wanted to understand what's next in terms of calendar and decision making. Thank you. I'll turn all the calendar questions to the Secretariat. Um, as I said, next week we had wanted to um, start informing the workshop proponents. We did um, consolidate the list right of the workshops, and did we have any comments? No. So we are presuming that those are the ones, at least for the first slot, that are um, accepted. So the Secretariat will start sending those ones out. Um, and also, uh, I'll finish and then you can interject. Um, <laughs> and then also there is the, um, we, uh, we are going to be sending, we, we are still in the process of formulating the exact um, agenda for the high level um, sessions, once those are done, we will be sharing um, the concept notes with you all. So um, that's fine. Uh, what else are we going to be doing right now? I beg your pardon? Yes. Uh, and then we're going to be doing the scheduling. And um, I know there's some plus ones and stuff like that. <clears throat> I think for the first lot of the plus ones, we should be 
plus ones, twos, and threes. We should be able to fill them in, but um, that's to do with the scheduling. The reason why we can't tell you with any definitive uh, information right now is because, you know, things are of different lengths, et cetera. So we, it's one of those things that we have to do a number of passes uh, across the schedule. Um, we will wait again uh, to see how the uh, main sessions um, play out. I think we should um, treat those ones as urgent uh, for the present moment in time um, because we, they, we need to also um, inform people and it's a back and forth with the panelists as well. I mean, uh, some of you are second and third years, so you know how that goes. Um, I'm looking at the secretary to add anything else. Um, there's the idea of villages, which the deadline is um, approaching soon, right? Uh, 26th of July, so uh, we also have to process that. Um, we are also have to process the, um, uh, the travel. And this is also very important as well because one of the metrics that uh, one of the ways um, that we select people who will be do, who will be receiving the um, travel support from the IGF is their involvement in you know panelists etc. That's why I said it, it's rather important that we get this done and set as fast as possible. Um, Anything else? No. Uh, we did have a time um, a mag uh, IGF time um, chart, which we can reshare as well. Um, that's what we're trying to. Um, we can just send it on to the internet. Um, uh, email, e email it just uh, for you to look at. Um, I think that's all that I can think of at the. A uh, moment. Yes, Bruna. Really quick. I know um, you've already discussed um, town halls, but it would be good to maybe get a full list of the sessions, lightning talks, town halls, open forums, just so we see what are the overlapping kind of areas. Um, I mean, I, no, uh, all the uh, yeah. sessions are on the website. Um, what's missing is what are the selected sessions, right? I know, I know. Yeah. But my point is, my point is about the selected ones because yes. I know that, for instance, for a lightning talk, there's kind of like two or three sessions that were submitted by the same organization, so they might need to decide which is going to be, or we might need to select what's the selected, like the final one. Mm -hmm. So it would yeah. be good to have this list. That's my request only. Yeah. Well, um, as soon as they're selected, we will. Um, uh, share that information, but yes, uh, uh, um, the secretary knows that you don't give four um, lightning talks to the same person or even one. Uh, so, we have to be fair. Yes. I'm, I'm not trying to, to school <laughs> anyone on their own work. Yeah, That's yeah. Not my point. My point is, it's important for us to know how many lightning talks are going to be on the agenda at the final kind of selection. I know it's not the same slot, but it's good to know for the community to know whether you have one lightning talk about, let's say, AI and gender bias, or like, we need, we need to answer questions from our communities. That's what I'm saying. And I'm already getting questions on what are the main sessions, what are the topics, which workshops have you approved? So, it would be nice to have a clearer picture on everything that's on the agenda. As soon as yeah. they are selected, as soon as we can uh, share the information, we will share their information. This information is also very important for people who are traveling and organizationally as well. So as soon as we have shareable information, we will share it. Mm. Um, just hang on. Is it the last one? Uh, Mark, why don't you just speak it out? Uh, 
Uh, Mark, can you um, just... Hi, hi. Yes, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, yes. Um, well, I, I made a couple of points, actually, and I hope, I hope they're quick ones uh, in the chat. Um, first of all, uh, with regard to the, uh, the village, uh, last year at Addis, uh, you remember the village was located uh, away from the main center of the IGF um, uh, event, uh, and that, I think, impacted on the uh, footfall, the, the number of people who were able to vi um, visit the village, the, the booths and, and so on, uh, was significantly lower, I think, and there were several complaints about that. So it was a question really about the location of the village um, at the conference center in Kyoto. Will it be uh, much more centrally uh, positioned uh, following the experience in Addis uh, last year? And uh, I, I haven't been able to follow um, this bag meeting fully, uh, and so I may have missed it, but um, I think I was expecting from comments you made on uh, Monday uh, in response to me that there would be a briefing on the funding situation for the IGF uh, and uh, the development of the strategy. Now, maybe this will be covered by the leadership panel in your next uh, exchange with them. Uh, perhaps that's the answer to my question on that. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Yes. Um... For the um, IGF village, it's within the venue. Uh, we have a fantastic, absolutely fantastic venue in Kyoto. Uh, we will be able to have the IGF village and everything. Uh, it's it's purpose built, so um, the flow is great, and I, we won't be having any of those issues about distances or anything like that. It's um, uh, I couldn't wish for a better venue there. Um, as we did have a small talk on the um, funding, we are going to be having more uh, with the IGF um, uh, leadership panel as well. Um, they do have a, a subgroup that is um, looking particularly at funding. Um, so that is scheduled for the leadership panel as well. So it's one of those things that we are continuously looking at. Yes. Mm. Alisa. Um, th Should I go? Or? Yes, please go. Okay, thank you. Um, so yesterday we discussed that um, the sessions that uh, are turned down, um, that they should get uh, enough feedback on why they are turned down. And um, I was looking in the Excel document that we received on, uh, which is called IGF 2023 evaluations by sub-theme, um, and um, where it says feedback for proposal organizer. Um, now and then it says um, something like good proposal um, whilst it was um, ranked, well, it, it, it's ranked basically, uh, for example, 44th out of um, 70 proposals. Um, if someone will receive that as feedback, they'll be like, okay, well, why was my proposal not selected? So um, please look again at what it said uh, what it says at the 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 um the section um for uh, feedback for the proposal organizer because it 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 makes us look rather ridiculous if we turn down proposals where it says timely and relevant proposal or good proposal um yeah um and will um well it, we've got this Feedback for the workshops, but also for the um, for the the town halls and the other sessions um, where people are, or where where sessions are turned down. Um, will they also receive any feedback on why their session wasn't um, wasn't um, uh, chosen to be part of the IGF schedule? So that's my final question. 
I'm sorry, I'm trying to pause through that. Um, <coughs> uh, first part of your question. There is feedback from MAG members, but some of the feedback says um, good workshop, but they're not rated particularly high. So, um, oh, you can, okay. Uh, so, shall I respond to what, okay. So, no, they, they are rated, for example, um, um, like this, this one is rated a, a 3.9. Um, well, that's not terrible or something. Um, but I, I cannot imagine that there wasn't more feedback to, to this proposal than just that one out of 10 p people said good proposal. Um, so either not all the feedback is captured in, in, um, in, in, in this section, um, or, well, well, I think that not all, all the feedback is, is captured in that section. Um, but it also, where it says good proposal, it, it sounds ridiculous to, sound, to, to turn a proposal down if it's a good proposal. Amrita, for the record, and you've raised a very pertinent question, but there are different facets to it. For example, a proposal is supposed to be rated by 10 people. 10 people come from different thought processes. They rate a particular proposal in a different way. They like or dislike a proposal in one way. Uh, out of 10, perhaps three have given their comments, three have not. But when it is scored, if out of 10, only five are scoring, the average is five, and the ranking is up based upon that. So it, it, yes, uh, not everyone has scored all proposals. That's the hard fact. We MAG members have not done our job. There is a lapse between our part. There is a lapse of us not updating things on the, uh, in our part, so we have to accept our responsibility. Now, I may have ranked a proposal very high and said it is a good proposal, but, some, but overall, cumulatively, it has not scored high. So obviously, if someone has not given that comment, uh, it, is, it stays, stays as high, uh, you know, um, as a good proposal. Uh, so obviously, for uh, when I, as a proposal submitter, my proposal is not accepted and I see a good proposal, I may be perplexed as to what it is. But there is also another part. There is no good proposal or bad proposal. We are trying to see at that point of time what fits our need and take the best. You know, we have a super rationalizing going in. We've been arguing that why out of X proposals we just can take 80 and why not 90. So it's a very tough job for us also. Um, I, we don't have a right answer, but we also have to look at that just scoring was not the way in which we took sessions. We also looked at other aspects, uh, that we balance the topics, we balance uh, the stakeholder diversity, um, regional diversity, et cetera. So there are many things which goes in selecting a proposal, and no proposal is a bad proposal. Everyone put in a lot of hard work to put in their proposals. I hope I've answered it. True. I mean, I don't think you would ever say that, you know, is there a comment that says this is a bad proposal, it shouldn't go? I think people have put the effort, the time, and the sweat into that proposal. It is a good proposal. Unfortunately, it just didn't make the catch due to some factors, a uh, miscellaneous number of factors. And we, yes, um, it may be a B plus, but the cutoff line was um, somewhat a bit higher. Or as Amrita was, I mean, I, I won't go on. I'm just repeating what Amrita says. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, allergy. Um, um, uh, thank you. You know, you know, it kind of brings me back to yesterday when I was uh, talking about the transparency itself. You, you know, when you look at the comment, actually, it seems only one person that actually has made that comment. So essentially, if we had um, all the comments on a particular topic, maybe that would actually help the proposal of the, of the, of the, of the, you know, of the topic itself. Because right now, when I read, for example, you may have, you know, 4.1, like example I gave yesterday, out of five, which is, which is very good. But one person may have commented and said, no, this is not a very good topic. But not knowing that there are 10, 15 or more of MAC members actually have rated it. So essentially, if we are able to capture all the comments in a, 
in a particular proposal that would actually help give feedback. Because if you look at the, the online chat, you see that one, one, somebody is saying that all their proposals actually are rejected. So you can easily tell, you know, yeah. score the, um, the things so we have to start at that that you know and then we can share those comments and should we make all comments obligatory and um, how would that have an effect on the score rate will it drop from 70 percent to 40 percent um you know, you know it's uh, we are uh, aiming for something, but we really can't achieve it due to uh, our, you know, resources, either be our personal resources for time and et cetera. So, yeah, I mean, where would we, we can't just get it from the ether. <laughs> yeah. That's um, very good. Yeah. Um, I was in interrupting when you started earlier, because you said you were sending um, letters to the workshop proposals that have been selected. And I wanted to make the point that in our group, we had some that had conditional comments. So um, the more expert members of our my group who take better notes, if, if we could look at the ones we have conditional comments on that we wanted to ask particularly about improvement, noting that improvement and suggesting improvement is part of the <laughs> workshop process, evaluation process, then we'd like to be able to do that. On the current discussion about how to deal with people rejected, perhaps we could have a quick message um, attached to the rejection um, from the chair explaining the very extensive discussions we've had this week um, rather than going into messages that may or may not have been written in the comments and assessment, which is simply thank you very much for your proposal. The, the MAG had very extensive and detailed discussions for two days in Geneva, and we're very sorry your proposal was rejected at this time. You know, so it's a, it's a blanket response. We don't have to go into whether or not some person put comments for the proposer or not when they were doing the evaluation, because that, as you've noted, is quite odd. Um, but my other question, so I've, that's my suggestion, is that we have a blanket cover letter which expresses the process and thanks them and just says sorry. But we have spent two days doing this, so I think it's fair to say they've people have had a fair chance at this. Um, um, my other question is, will you be writing to the organizers of open forums, day zero events, lightning talks, et cetera, to say that they've been accepted or not? Is that within the Secretariat's next week of work? And uh, please do not write to the town halls just read. With the, with the, with the traditional caveat of, of bingo with, the, with that word. So yeah, it's the, so one is, could we please have a discussion, at least in our group, about conditional? Are you writing to open forums, day zeros, networking sessions, et cetera, et cetera, to say they're accepted? And please don't write to town halls. And could we have a cover letter as a general explanation of process and thanks to people for submitting? But very sorry, not this year. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, can we have a cover letter? Yeah. Yes, we can have a cover letter. Um, the other one, uh, just taking it one by one, is, is that okay if I answer? Just taking it one by one. Um, the, uh, one of the other requests was that we hold off um, for the conditional acceptance, correct? Yes, we can hold off. We, uh, I think it's best to work on a deadline that how long do you think you need? No, no, she says, she's saying that we shouldn't, I mean, what I heard was that we shouldn't communicate with the conditional ones just yet. Because what we usually do is that we communicate with them and tell them that you are conditionally accepted if you do A, B, and C, and you have until this time to do it until. And if they do it on that time, then we accept it. If it's something simple, we can take care of it. If it's something more complicated, we can throw it back to you. Um, that's what we usually do. Yes, you can also give them to come back with an okay faster because this time you have less time. Uh, so do you want us to still do that? As in... Okay. 
who, yeah, yeah, because who that's and the, make your life, <laughs> uh, Secretariat's uh, life easy. Because Give them that is the process we, we usually do, is that for conditional, it's a condition. So you're accepted if you fulfill this condition by this date, and then we put you in the thing. I mean, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, my, my point that we have to tell you that they're conditional, right? Otherwise, <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, some are accepted, but yes. I was just pointing out that some within the group that I was part of had some that had a few conditional points. Ah, so, so and they're were, not indicated. We, no, we have to... Uh, uh, thank you. They are indicated, so... That, that, I don't yeah, I, we needed understand. the wiser person, but it was to point out that thing, so we're all right. Let's talk about it afterwards. It's okay. So there's no request? <laughs> well, I'm, let's just check afterwards. Just double check. Yeah, uh, uh, basically there's nothing different from what we've done before or... <laughs> that's... Nothing different. Nothing different, oh, okay. Then that's fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering uh, because, um, yeah. Um, I think we deal with the workshops first because the workshops are the most complicated. Um, they're the ones with the more um, moving part and then and then again, um, the others are basically just more of the others, except for the day zero events, are basically fillers, you know, like the lightning talks and stuff like that. Um, so we do the most, the ones that um, we feel that people require more time on, which is the workshops. And then we do it on a rolling basis. We can't do everything at the same time. Um, I think if I've missed something else that is very important, please let me know. But Chris, then peace. Thanks, Cheng Tai, Chris Buckridge, MAG member, tech community. Um, I don't want to extend this much further. Just one thing to say, and I think it's important whether we're discussing this as MAG members or community or in any formal communications, there are no rejected workshop proposals. There are simply workshop proposals that were not selected. That, that, I mean, we keep talking about rejected. Please, let's stop using that word because it's not accurate. It really, and it, it kind of plays into this discussion of, well, I got good comments, so why wasn't I selected? Yeah, we got a lot of good, good proposals. Many of them got good comments because they were good, because they scored more than four out of five. But we can't put all of those into the, into the agenda. So it's not about being rejected. It's simply about we have a limited number of slots and we have chosen as best we can um, for the good of the event itself. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I think people should, MAG members should certainly still keep putting comments in, even if, yeah, they may seem a little confusing, but hopefully that context when provided to the proposers will make them less confusing. Thank you, Chengetai, for the flow. I want to start by giving a plus one to what Chris just said, that uh, we did not reject them, but rather we had to pick a few workshops. So I thought that I should just say these words as we are concluding as the uh, co-facilitator for the workshop processes. I think we did a great job. Every and a couple of MAG members were really there through the forms, the criteria, and all that. I have taken a few notes or so about a few things that we could look at and uh, later on next year probably we'll have we'll review the whole process and see how we can make it better. But I think something that we will uh, definitely focus on will also be the trainings because you see that uh, we don't have so many newcomers or workshops uh, proposals coming from the Global South. So I think that calls a lot of uh, calls for trainings or capacity building, which I think uh, the working group will really look at for next year. Otherwise, thank you all for, for your participation in the evaluations and the workshop yeah, processes. Thank you. And thank you, Peace, and also thank you for the group as well, for the evaluation group. I know it was hard work, <laughs> uh, particularly, um, yeah. uh, Bruna. Picking up on some suggestion I made yesterday it would be good. I don't know if whether it's the same material as the cover letter Adam was just picking off, but it would be good to kind of have a blog post or any sort of text that provides a breakdown on the workshop evaluation for this year is the one where we got the most, kind of our, our record um, to the date, and would be good to more or less understand a little bit more. And, and that's kind of like also hints at some of the comments um, from yesterday on enhancing transparency, 
for the MAG process. So I don't know whether it's the workshop, um, the working group on the workshop evaluation or the chair or the secretariat or the three of them that can do it together. But I happen to think it would be nice and like transparency related, um, interesting suggestion to do. Uh, thank you, Bruna. Um, Tamia? Thank you very much. Uh, I hope every MAG member has finished taking the floor because I don't want to jump the queue as an observer. Um, but I, I did want to, to share a couple of last thoughts uh, um, from, from the past three days. Um, as Mattia shared his perspective as a um, uh, parliamentary member, I, I thought I, I would share a couple of thoughts with you um, now in, in an observer capacity, having already sat where you are sitting as MAG members in the past. Um, in terms of um, the selection of uh, workshops, thank you for responding for my ask for, for more transparency yesterday. I think a letter from the chair or the secretariat or whomever explaining the process the MAC took to take um, the decisions and, and sharing that with those that didn't get selected uh, would help because I do agree with those who said else you're just going to get the positive notes that the MAC has shared on your proposal that it was great and with a regret that it wasn't selected so it might be a bit um, yeah confusing so so thank you for first of all for that um, secondly Thanks for the, the really rich discussions on, on, on the main sessions. Um, I think the community would very much appreciate when you're ready to, to do that, um, an, an itemized list of decisions taken here in, in the past three days in terms of timelines, uh, in terms of groups, um, and in terms of the way forward, including and especially this on where the community can contribute now. So the community will know your sessions were selected for either uh, an open forum or eventually a town hall or a workshop or something. So when it, after they know this decision, where else can they focus their attention? Can they contribute to the main sessions? Can they s suggest high-level speakers? What is it that the com community can do? I think it would be very much appreciated for them to know. And to whom to reach out to with, with those contributions? Um, and in, in that note, I, I um, do echo the, um, the call for, for a schedule um, and, and a bit of a, a transparency on, on the next steps and deadlines so that the community can plan. Um, and last but not least, and I'm going to sound as a broken record, I think Cengar already knows what I want to say, communication efforts about the IGF. Now that we have a program, themes, sessions, uh, what is it planned and on what channels um, to now actually start getting people to come to Kyoto uh, and how can the community help with that, um, including um, what is the plan of the MAG, what is the plan of the Secretariat and what is the plan of the leadership panel um, and then how, how are those coming together and, and where can the community jump to, um, to multiply your efforts to communicate about the event. Um, I think those are my, my three points. Um, and then just one question. I think I've missed um, information about how the day zero schedule is going to be populated and when we will have info on that. So uh, if I missed that, sorry, but if somebody can respond to that question, that would be great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Timia. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are going to have a action point oriented summary report that will come out next week that will detail action points, et cetera, that have been um, decided um, this week. We usually have it at the end of the week, but since it's a full week for us, it's gonna come out next week. Um, as for the day zero schedule, as soon as we have it and it's ready to publish, we will um, publish it. Um, uh, we also have to check with people that they still can make it, they still can do it, et cetera. It's just some things that we do. But yes, we will not sit on any information. As soon as we have the information and it's publishable, we will publish it. Uh, do I have uh, Chris and Adam? Okay. Yeah, I have a 
uh, a quick question or comment. Day zero, I, I'm not going to be at day zero. My daughter's getting married in Kyoto, so I'm going to be there, and I'm very sorry you can't be invited. But never mind. I'll, I'll send you pictures. And, and it's her birthday today. Anyway, um, what I wanted to ask was, um, w w would you think you'll have the new MAG, MAG members selected, and could they be in Kyoto? I know it's really short notice, but the possibility is someone is leaving the MAG, and it's been an absolute joy. Um, um, it would be real. I know it's really helpful if they could be there. So, if there's any way to accelerate that process, encourage them to be there, then it would be very, very helpful for them all. I'm sure. So, just a just a thought there. And if anybody, I I didn't live in Kyoto. I lived in Tokyo. But if anybody needs any bits of advice about things, except restaurants, um, then happy to do that. Thanks. For the question and. Um... Uh, and the lack of invitation, but that's fine. Uh, yes, it is our intention, our hope, that um, as with previous uh, MAGs, that we can have the new MAG members come to Kyoto and also have a joint MAG meeting with the outgoing mag as well so there can be an exchange of experiences and ideas and it's also good for them to see what they'll be working towards for next year so um it's beyond our control because the uh, mag list has to go to the secretary general's office and it really depends on his schedule and when that can be looked at and um, suggestions made and be approved. So, uh, yeah, it's out of our hands, but we will try from our part and from DESA's part, we'll work as fast as possible uh, to make that happen. Elisa? Thank you, Chengatai. I, um, I fully understand the struggle, um, though um, if, this is, if this seems to be a struggle every year, why not send out the request for new MAG members earlier in the year so we can inform them earlier in the year and we can ensure that they can be there at the IGF? Um, and for that matter, also, well, we have a deadline to apply to become a MAG member, why not set a, another deadline um, for um, UNDESA to inform people when you will become a MAG member? This is, I mean, the IGF has been there now for 70 years. This is part of professionality towards MAG members to inform them in time when they are a MAG member. Uh, thanks, Elisa. I will pass the message forward. Oh, okay. I don't know if you want to open it, close it. Uh, close it. Um, I mean, we're meeting next. I mean, we're meeting tomorrow. There's the um, reception that starts at six at the WMR. That's across the road. Um, I can say that, or. Oh. oh, sorry, my mic doesn't. <laughs> Um, I think we've come to the end, unless there's something else that uh, we need to... Um, uh, what room are we in tomorrow morning? Room number three. Number three. So it should be in building A. Yes, Timia. Just a, a, a logistical question. Um, badges for this meeting are available, are valid until today. Do people need to register to come into the building tomorrow? Those who didn't register for the leadership meeting. Oh, sorry. I didn't. Okay. Okay. Didn't realize. I did. I didn't know if everybody did. So I just wanted to pre confirm if that. Okay.
Um, there's the reception at the WMO, which is across the road where, no, the Red Cross is this way. There's the chair and where you catch the trams. It's further down where the railway station is, Chesheron. Um, oh, no, I'm driving there, so. Um, uh, basically, you have to go out through the flag gate and then turn left. Yes. So just turn left, just walk down. You see where the train station is? It's WMO. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, just close the meeting. Okay, so that you can all get to this place, we're going to close the meeting. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Gracias.